the wish. <laughs> Are we ready to go? 63%. Yeah, Members work. of the public are advised the meeting will be live streamed and recorded and the live stream and video recording will be made publicly available on YouTube and Council's website. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, Nell and Vic Shire's last Ordinary Council meeting for the term, so welcome, everybody. Nilabik Shire Council acknowledges the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of the land upon where we are meeting and we would also like to pay our respects to their elders both past and present and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians present. Almighty God, we ask your blessing upon this Council. We pray for guidance in our deliberations and we ask you to grant us wisdom and sensitivity as we deal with the business of our shy to achieve the best outcome for the people of Moonbi. Amen. We have no apologies, but we do have a presentation and I'm going to hand over to Councillor Ashton. Thank you, Councillor Ashton. Thank you. <clears throat> um, thank you, everybody. Um, many of you would be aware that um, we lost uh, Mick Woodward on the 26th of August. And I would just like to say a few words as a tribute to, to Mick Woodward. Um, Mick, as he was usually known, grew up in Frankston and worked as a bricklayer for 40 years. He had four children with his wife, Margaret. They built a mud brick home um, in the Bend of Isles. And he said living there was the highlight of his life. <clears throat> Excuse me. They stayed there for many years before moving to Eltham, where Margaret sadly passed away in 2012. It wasn't until Mick was 60 that he enrolled in his first university degree and he did a thesis on Christmas Hills and this evolved into his first book, which many of you might have read, Once Around the Sugar Loaf. Having never written anything until then, but having been an avid reader all his life, he went on to become a respected author and local historian who over those years more than, wrote more than 25 books and papers. He comprehensively researched and wrote extensively about European settlement in the Eltham and Kangaroo Ground districts, particularly commenting on the resulting impacts on the local or Indigenous Wurundjeri clan. Mick was a founding member of the Nilambit Reconciliation Group and the Friends of the Wurundjeri. And he was also on the Kangaroo Ground Memorial Park and Tower of Remembrance Advisory Committee. As a member of the Eltham District Historical Society Committee, he helped establish the Andrew Ross Museum at Kangaroo Ground. Mick and Margaret were honoured as joint Olympic Citizens of the Year in 2006. Mick was a decisive initiator of change who brought people and history into the landscape and truly was a local legend. He will be missed by his family as well as, well as many in the community and beyond. Val Mick Woywood, and um, it was a privilege to have known him, if only for a short while. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'll now hand over to um, Mr Cowie, our CEO, who would like to say a few words as well. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, councillors and uh, members of the gallery. This is a short uh, acknowledgement of the mayor and the deputy mayor, as is the custom uh, each year. Traditionally, we would uh, acknowledge the work of the outgoing mayor and deputy mayor at the statutory meeting of council, as this is the last ordinary meeting of council for this term of council. However, uh, on behalf of the organisation, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the hard work of Councillor Egan and Councillor Clark in their role of Mayor and Deputy Mayor, respectively, since uh, October of last year. Again, under normal circumstances, we would have presented uh, a, a token of um, our appreciation to the Mayor and the Deputy Mayor, uh, which we're not able to do this evening, but we will do so at an appropriate time upon the conclusion of the caretaker period. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cowan. <coughs> Councillor Clark. Mayor, you may wish to respond also, but can I just thank um, 
the CEO for those kind words and on behalf of the uh, on behalf of all of the staff. Can I also just go on to highlight, and I guess as many are aware, this will be my last meeting of this council. In fact, it may well be my last meeting ever in local government terms, except for perhaps a short meeting uh, next week on, on, a, on a short matter. Um, can I just uh, basically just thank the community and, and staff for their support, contribution and advice during the term. I started this journey of my four years at um, Nillenbeck with the intention of only serving one term. And essentially it was intended originally uh, following some meetings with uh, what became Councillor Rankin, who was looking to stand for local government and a friend of his also looking to stand to mentor them about what that might, might occur. And that, that sort of commenced in early 2016. Um, his friend uh, didn't proceed and at the 11th hour, I <coughs> agreed to sort of join and stand myself in the Wingrove Ward. Um, at that stage, really not knowing anybody else who was standing for council, I subsequently just leading up to that, I think I met Councillor Ashton on one occasion and I met uh, Councillor Egan on two or three occasions and, and <coughs> it was interesting to outline what they were looking to do by way particularly of some planning scheme amendments C101 and C81, which. Uh, I equally did not support and I uh, was happy to support them. But as it turned out, um, I was elected, Councillor Ranker was elected and uh, current Mayor Egan was elected um, and Councillor Ashton, um, of course, Councillor Perkins, who had served for many years on Nillenbeck Council. I'd never met Councillor Perkins and it, similarly with Councillor Brooker and Ju Councillor Jumer who I had never met. It's always an interesting journey when you start off in these spaces. Um, because you don't know the rapport that is going to develop and the relationships that will develop along the way. I was fortunate and, and honoured to have been elected for the first two years as mayor and then in the last 12 months as deputy mayor. Um, and it indeed has been a privilege to have met many members of the community. Um, I just want to thank firstly my fellow councillors. Um, we do not agree on all matters and it would be surprising if we did. But I certainly do recognise the amount of work and effort that each of them um, puts into participating in the council meetings and seeking, seeking to represent the communities. There's no doubt in the first few months, in some ways, Councillor Jumerick put it uh, to me very well the other night as a football analogy. He suggested that I had the advantage of playing in the AFL. Uh, Councillor Perkins then had an advantage of playing probably... Uh, in the VFL and had probably not quite got to the AFL given I'd been to Melbourne. And, and everybody else was basically a rookie just coming off the bench. Um, and in fairness, that's probably how it felt at the start. No one spoke much, it's good times. Um, and we went through the meetings, uh, people wondering how to speak, how to put a motion, what to do. But I've got to say, certainly as we started, and I said to everybody on day one, it's going to be downhill from here because we hadn't offended anybody at that stage um, and everybody was getting along fine. Um, there's no doubt, uh, I won't go through it all, but, you know, policy issues, the nature of issues that crop up create tensions. Um, but equally, everybody is at the end of the day trying to do right, the right thing by the community. I just say that I would have said uh, from my perspective in uh, the journey that we have achieved in um, four years, what many would have taken a decade to do. Um, and I think we've done things right throughout uh, the community. Um, in whatever ward, we've not found um, any particular favour of any unique area. Uh, we've tried to work for the entire community. Um, can I thank just the, uh, I'm not sure there's a time limit on this, so can I? Um, Keep going. The CEO uh, that I've worked with, firstly, Stuart Burdak, who uh, certainly I worked with very well. Um, and uh, then of course, Mark Stormer who came in uh, and I think was remarkable and working through an agenda which we put together, very much talking about living in the landscape. And um, I think that became quite a catch cry for a number of us. And then uh, concluding with um, Carl Cowie who has been an exceptional administrator and one that I'm very pleased to know that the show will be in good hands Support received from Lynn Gowdy as, a, as an executive assistant to the mayor and councillors and Gail Thomas prior to that. 
I'd want to recognise the excellence in the quality of the staff that we have and the support that we have received. Um, it, it has actually been exemplary and I'm very excited to, I guess, have left at a time when I think the, the quality and the excellence that, we, that I certainly leave behind is second to none in any local government and I, I'd measure them against a lot that I've participated in. Um, you know, we have had a good time. It's been exciting. It's never been dull. Um, there are some great outcomes that have been achieved for the community. I've had the privilege of writing to all of my constituents and ratepayers to tell them what I think are the highlights of that. And I'd just like to thank them for the very many emails and, and telephone calls that I've had, recognising the good work of this council broadly and the and unique uh, roles that I guess I've played in Wingrove. So I wish well those who will follow me. I'm sure it will be a hard fought contest. Uh, I'd like to thank, as I said, the, the members of the community at the end of the day that we all are elected to represent and support. Um, and I thank them for the, the contributions and the recognition that they have, have provided. I started in 1981. There were no telephones uh, of mobile phones. There were, there were no computers. There were no mobile phones. Um, some nearly 40 years later, I'm still going at this and many would say it's probably a good time to to stop and probably my wife would be first in that list. Um, and I'd also want to just recognise in concluding her support through those 40 years in local government and my family who have lived through my local government and media career along the journey. Um, I was a local government councillor before I was married or had any children. So they've had to put up with it for all of those years. And for those of us who are all who are in local government know that's not easy for any family member. So I'd want to recognise and thank them for their contribution and, and uh, so thank you all and I look forward to tonight and uh, watching what happens in the years go forward. You probably won't have the advantage of me joining you at any further council meetings. Um, I didn't go to a council meeting before I was elected and I'm not rushing to turn up afterwards. So good luck into the future. I'll watch uh, to keep good low rates and good governance and um, I'll certainly let you know if you get it wrong. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Um, and as he's taken up all my time, <laughs> no, not really. I just want to basically reiterate a lot of what he said. My main concern is to really just thank my fellow councillors. It's been a learning curve for five of us. The two Peters both had experience, the rest of us has had none, and I'm sure they will all agree with me when I say that um, nobody, none of us had any idea about the intricacies and the, um, the time constraints put on us going in as rookie councillors. Um, I'd like to thank the current CEO, Carl Cowley. Um, Peter's already thanked all of the preceding staff, but also the, the current staff. I mean, we've had some amazing outcomes in the last term, but none of that would have happened without the staff. From the EMT down, um, we've just got some astonishing talent um, to the point where other councillors are coming to us for advice, whether it's the fire mitigation strategy, planning issues, other councillors are saying, well, how did Neil and Big do that? And they're coming to us. So that goes back directly to the staff. So a massive thank you to them. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what uh, the next year brings and the next term on council. So thank you again, everybody. And I appreciate all the help that everybody's given me over the last four years, and especially to Councillor Ashton, because we came in together knowing each other. She was the only one I really knew and we both had rural issues. And I feel between the two of us now that rural Nilambic does have a voice. So I'd like to thank you for the help there as well. So that's all I've got to say on that matter. So could I now have a mover for the confirmation of the minutes for the meeting held on Tuesday the 5th of August, please? Councillor Clark. Um, and a seconder, please. Councillor Booker, all those in favour? And that is carried. Thank you. There are no disclosures of conflicts of interest that I've been aware of, and no questions, but we do have some questions from the gallery. Our first question is from Michael Cruz, Krause. Um, 
And question one is, on or around what date did council officers first become aware of the potential 20.5 million increase in the estimated landfill? As it was not, it doesn't appear to be reflected in any budgets. Somebody's got the microphone, I think, because I'm getting reverb. Can council provide an assurance that it is not due to any previously unidentified environmental or health Hazards. Otherwise, can the council advise what specific items have caused the 20.5 million estimated cost flare up? The cost of rehabilitating the former plenty and kangaroo ground sites in accordance with the EPA's post closure pollution abatement notice is based on current market prices as a result of a competitive tender process undertaken in 2019 and the inclusion of the 30 year aftercare costs. Question two. Is the annual report, in the annual report, there's a new total 18.3 mil five-year commitment described as waste without any further elaboration, which I assume is related to the landfill contract. Um, it's a rather long question. I'll let you read there. The question is, on what date was this tender awarded and can this council advise how it believes a future council could fund this 18 million, million contractual commitment without either significantly increasing rates, charges, debt or running down cash reserves? The detail disclosed in note 5.7 does not relate to the landfill rehabilitation contract. The amount detailed in note 5.7 relates to operational expenditure in delivering the waste service. Next question is from John Facundo. The council plan 2017 to 21 published in 2017 states in the introduction by the mayor that our four year program targets the repayment of all of this debt, 13.8 million at the time saving the Shire more than $800,000 in interest payments, which we can reallocate to important community programs. I note the 2019-20 financial report, the total borrowing costs for the last financial year was 709,000 and the 2021 budget indicates that current borrowings are almost 14 million, page seven. Similar to the initial debt level and the predicted closing balance of borrowings, which still be approximately 4 million in 2029 to 30. Can you explain Please explain why this key objective of this council that we have heard about many times has not been achieved during its tight term as promised. The net debt position of council at 30 June 2020 is 6.9 million. This comprises of 10.8 million of loan balances offset by 3.9 million held in the debt reserve. Council has listed 3.3 million of borrowings in the current budget for 2021, which may be required to fund capital works projects. The additional borrowings listed for the 2021 year have increased the overall debt position published in the public budget document. Number three, Mark MacDonald asked, with the contracting of garbage waste collection, could council please tell the residents of Nellambic who bears the risk regarding vehicle damage if it occurs when a waste operator is collecting waste? And the answer is that the contractor is responsible for any vehicle damage that they cause. Two, could council please tell the residents of Nillenbeck how much has been paid out in dollar terms in redundancy payments to former council employees since October 2016? The amount paid in redundancies from October 2016 to present is approximately 3.2 million. Over the five year period, this is approximately 1.9% of annual employee costs. And that is the end of the questions. So we now go to our advisory committee reports, uh, 00920. Can I have a mover for the motion, please? Um, Councillor Ashton. Would you like to unmute yourself? Thank you. So the count, as per the recommendation, the council notes the minutes of the following meetings. Arts and Cultural Advisory Committee, 15th of June, 2020. Environment Sustainability Advisory Committee, 17th of June, 2020. And also, I believe, Positive Aging Advisory Committee, 3rd of July, 2020. Thank you. Can I have a second for the motion, please? Councillor Booker, back to you, Councillor Ashton. Thank you. Um, yes, look, uh, uh, first of all, I, I'd very much like to thank all members of our arts 
that includes the present members and those who served on the previous committee um, four years ago now. Um, the expertise that they've brought and shared with us is priceless. Uh, their guidance and advice on all things art and culture are most appreciated. Their hard work and the additional hours spent outside of meetings is noted and very much valued. Also, a wonderful dedicated arts officers including Simon Doyle, Richard Hull, and particularly Sarah Hammond, who brings her knowledge and enthusiasm and can-do attitude to everything she's involved in. Our arts and culture plan, under the stewardship of our Mayor Karen Egan, set a high bar and one that this committee has helped us to achieve. The investigation of a regional gallery, increased budget for acquisitions, arts and culture grants, the amazing digital agora, a Nilambic digital heritage guide, Youth Theatre, the Anglers Club, and soon to be the historical signage of St Andrews at last. As well as the long running favourites such as the Nilambic Prize, the Alan Marshall Short Story Prize and our wonderful open studio weekends, they've all thrived and prospered under this committee. Even during these very difficult times, our advisory committee and our officers are producing the most wonderful work to support local artists and writers and bring local events um, sorry, and put on local events. This keeps the art community engaged and the wider public entertained. 163 artists were commissioned in the time of COVID-19. Artist opportunities. Um, and we had Live July, which live streamed, which 47 artists were involved across 36 different events. We have done so well during these very difficult times. Not only that, many of you might have seen art in the time of COVID where 20 pieces of work were turned into stencils and put on the pavement. So many of you out in the community walking or jogging um, could, could enjoy some of the whimsical and some of the rather sad poetry and other prose that were put out there for the community, by the community. Um, so very much recommend the advisory committee reports for our arts advisory group. Can I have another few minutes? Because I also want to just cover the Environment and Sustainability Committee. Okay. Um, again, we've had pleasure in working with two ESAC uh, committees over the term of this council. I'd like to thank all those that have served on those committees and those that are still serving and probably working on some of those things as we speak tonight. It's a very diverse committee with a very wide, wide range of interests, passions and knowledge. It's very much our sounding board with regard to all things in environment and sustainability. It allows us to have respectful and meaningful conversations on everything from the Green Wedge Management Plan, weed and pest control, the actions with regard to the Queensland fruit fly, land care, regenerative farming, and most recently, our Climate Change Action Plan. Again, our officers have been open to giving and receiving information, taking on board the varied ideas put forward and moving away from previous very locked ideas about environment and sustainability. And sustainability. I'd like to thank our team and particularly Lisa Piddle, Kirsten Reedy, Ian Colbard, John Miller um, for working so well with this advisory committee. This committee has helped us prepare our submissions into ecosystem decline in Victoria, helped us frame our advocacy and education programs with regard to Queensland fruit fly control, supported our online education and engagement activities during COVID and supported very much our solar farm aspirations. They've also very much embraced this Sustainable House Day, um, which I would like to plug as it's happening this Sunday and much, much more. They will help us implement parts of our Green Wedge Management Plan, help us develop our Climate Action Plan consultation process and help us prepare a meaningful draft prior to public consultation. So again, I recommend that Council notes the minutes of the meeting of the 17th of June and would like to personally thank this, both these committees. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ashton. Councillor Booker. Look, um, just to say the Positive Ageing Advisory Committee report is here. Um, there is a new committee, as I think I've spoken to before, that will be uh, carrying the ball forward um, in the term, in the positive ageing space. So I wish that new committee well, um, not, you know, no matter who is uh, who happens to be chairing it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Booker. Um, any other councillors wish to speak? If not, I'll put it to the vote. All those in favour? 
And that is unanimous and carried. Thank you, councillors. Our first officer's report is 16820, the State Government Yanyang Road Stage 2 Upgrade Project, just EESS. -E Can I have a mover for the recommendation? Councillor Booker. I'll read that out, it's fairly short. That council notes the CEO officer will prepare and lodge a submission to the Yan Yun Road Stage 2 environmental effects statement public consultation process. Thank you, can I have a second to the motion? Councillor Perkins, back to you, Councillor Booker. Thank you. Uh, look, the takeouts, uh, the deadline for public submissions is October the 9th. Residents and community groups need to submit by, by then. The EES itself is literally hundreds of pages. You take a look at the Nuremberg submission, at least that will give you some headline topics to base your own maybe submission around. Some specific issues are for Blue Lake, which is covers uh, about half of it, maybe a little more of, of the duplication. Uh, 12 trees have very high retention value, 148 of high uh, retention value. These numbers were calculated incorrectly for stage one and we want a better kind of process for stage two. Um, Nilimbic uh, require a tree impact assessment report with offsets, a last resort. Uh, replacement tree planting, uh, not enough attention was play, paid to this area for stage one. We need a tree replacement ratio to put some metrics around, you know, the frequently cited, you know, we're gonna replace as many as we can. Uh, MPRV need to prepare a repurposed timber plan this will provide some specific guidance around timber reuse for public art, street furniture, mulch. This was done for stage one, but a rigorous framework around it will mean much better outcomes for the community in stage two. Under biodiversity, Nuremberg need a three-year maintenance program for new planting and landscaping, which occurred on stage one and is one year more than typically MPRV do. Um, some specific um, plans relating to the swift parrot, um, the flax lily, some targeted signage around kangaroo warnings and fauna bridges for residents. If you want to take a look at one, check out Memorial Drive section. If you're fortunate around twilight, you could see it in use. Um, we require on this biodiversity front a hollow tree translocation plan to reuse hollows in the area. Uh, directional signage is need, needs to be provided around the construction area, area of the Yarrambat Archery Club and the Horse and Riding Club and some extra upgrade and sealing of that entrance to those clubs as part of the works to put that into scope. Land acquisition impacts, the golf course is a council asset, the Nilibic uh, flagging and the master plan that supports a realignment um, of, the, of, of, of the course possibly with a golf course start architect that, me, that MPRV you know, compensate council and the operator for lost business. The alternative is a 30, 36 metre high uh, fence 772 to 758 Yan Yin Road uh, needs to be connected to sewer as part of the scope for stage two, Yarrambat Vet Hospital. The reinstatement of tre uh, screening trees, I was speaking to the proprietor today and is just um, thrilled that the car park that was to be uh, taken from her business is under uh, the design at this point going to be retained. Uh, there's technical provisions, a number of them concerning offsetting where lots are reduced um, lower than 0.4 of a hectare limit that through the PAO, the public acquisition overlay, those circumstances, all vegetation on that reduced lot size is considered lost. That's a technical provision concerning 173 agreements. Um, there's a requirement for MPRV to provide a gateway feature at the north end corner of Yan Yun Road and Ironbark Road that will complement the Yarrambat Public Realm Master Plan that has a budget of 280,000 in 2021 that we've just been informed about. Uh, traffic impacts in particular, the rat running issue has got to uh, improve from stage one. Uh, traffic turn bans uh, during AM and PM peaks have got to be considered in the local area traffic management plan that we are calling on. This includes left in, left out at Yarrambat Primary to discourage movements along that, that little area and also Heard Avenue access um, via the bus stop at Young's Road needs to be signalised. Specific safety measures have to be installed at Bannon's Lane and Laurie Street. I've got some material about 
uh, turn bands, uh, in particular at Laurie Street. There's a missing link in the shared trail between Vista Court and Ashley Road that needs to be fixed. We need the shared path there, not just a footpath. The detail and colour of retaining walls, of retaining, yeah, retaining walls was a big issue in stage one uh, that needed need to be submitted prior to council. Um, and that is the key word um, with a lot of these plans. They need to see, be submitted to council prior to works commencing. So Nillenbeck can have some sign off on all of these areas. Um, the retaining walls, you know, we need to look at the texture, how they're designed to be sympathetic to the landscape. The grey oxide, which was one of the contributions of the community panel on the shared pathway, also needs to continue for stage two. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor Booker. Councillor Perkins. Um, yeah, thanks. Happy to support Councillor Booker um, in the motion. And just a couple of couple of quick points. Um, you know, the Aramut Golf Course, obviously the um, 30 to 36 metre long and 30 metre high um, fence uh, is or 30, 360 metre long, sorry, and between 30 and 36 metre high fence along uh, the Yarramat Park, um, Yanian Road is, is uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a real impact. Um, you know, perhaps there's no way around that, um, short of realigning the Yarramat Golf Course. Um, realigning the golf course would uh, definitely be a better outcome than a, a 36 metre high fence um, going for 360 metres. Um, in the, uh, I think officers have done, done a good job um, insofar as the, the draft submission that we've got in front of us um, to be uh, put up by the CEO. Um, in terms of traffic and, and transport impacts, I've spoken previously about option C in terms of why, um, you know, I believe that option C uh, was a better option than, than uh, the one being put forward uh, that that being option B, and um, you know it's good that in in the uh, the papers it says the council strongly supports option C because it provides an intersection that satisfies the following priorities. Um, it lists a number of things, uh, and I've asked officers to include some of those selling points from option C that uh, that actual uh, major projects Victoria um, provided council, and they they were the minimal impact of the Doreen business precinct. It wasn't just about uh, you know, the, the business on our side of the road. Yeah, there are significant businesses on the Doreen side of the road. So uh, option C uh, would have impacted or would impact uh, those businesses to a far lesser extent than um, the option uh, B that's, that's been put forward. Um, it's also important that uh, option C would have retained more trees in the medium strip um, along Bridging Road. I think we need to include that in, in there. Um, the, the report uh, or the submission talks about retains a rural feel to Doctors Gully Road. So I'd, I'd like officers, um, Carl, to go a bit stronger on that in terms of uh, discouraging greater traffic flows along Doctors Gully Road. So, you know, there probably will be greater traffic flows, but, but you know, we, we need uh, as best we can to minimise those traffic uh, flows along Doctors Gully Road as, as a result of, of any intersection works um, along there. We don't want Doctors Gully Road to become a, an outer ring road or a rat run through Hurstbridge, um, you know, Waddle Glen and, and all our small townships. Um, I think that's the real concern, um, particularly for the people of Hurstbridge, that, uh, you know, this will this will act as a funnel to funnel people through uh, Doctors Gully Road um, and in, into Hurstbridge as, as, a, as a rat run through the area. Uh, the, uh, it also talks about, um, you know, Diamond Creek Road and requesting... Um, more work, Diamond Creek Road, you know, south of Yan Yan Road, between uh, Diamond Creek Road, uh, between Yan Yan Road and and, uh, and the bypass. Uh, so that's complementary work. So it highlights that, that point as well. And I'm out of time, so thank you. Thank you. Any other councillors wish to speak? If not, I'd just like to say a few words, and it might be surprising to many, but I can agree completely with what Council Perkins has just said. I'd also like to add a few extra points, especially with Dr. Scully Row, which leads into the Doreen Primary School. The rat run there, it's just asking for problems. We've got a brand new footpath that went in from that corner all the way down to the school. So I wanna make sure that that's um, duplicated if that's going to disappear. The other in, uh, issue that's really quite important is the intersection that currently goes into the lake and the Yarrabat Horse and Pony Club and the the other sporting uh, precincts in the back there. Um, we also have CFA that use the lake in terms of 
when fires are on. So we need to have actually, it needs to be really addressed very carefully so that trucks, horses and floats, etc., big things like that can get out and in um, easily without blocking traffic. So it, the current proposition I don't think works at all. And I think Councillor Ashton agreed with me on that one as well. So we need to really make sure that's covered off properly as well. Um, like Councillor Perkins, I'm also really concerned about there's about 30 massive big gums that are currently running along the edge of the reserve um, that are in fabulous nick. They're at least 100 years old, just those ones, and they need to be retained somehow. Um, like Councillor Perkins again, I wanted to go with option C. I think it's a far more sensible idea. Stop looking so shocked, Councillor Perkins. We do agree sometimes. Um, so we're totally on the same page here. So I want to make sure all those things are addressed as well. So uh, I'll now put it to the vote. All those in favour? And that is carried. Thank you. Don't get used to it, that Councillor Perkins. Our next item is 16920, the Hurstbridge Line Upgrade, Stage 2, Offset Parking and Boundary Extension. Can I have a mover for the motion, please? Councillor Clark. Councillor Perkins, Councillor Clark. I think it was Councillor Perkins, sorry. Councillor. Yeah, I had some uh, some words we're going to add in, if that's all right, Councillor Clark. I think in the pre-met you were comfortable with those. Um, no, they've been sent, sent round. Um, the words that were going to be added to the ones in the in the papers Further down. were in were in red. Next, that's it. There we go. So, so C, um, council would support temporary commuter car park, commuter parking Coventry Oval Diamond Creek to offset anticipated loss of commuter car parking at Diamond Creek Station. Um, the rest is as as per the papers until we get to uh, dot point D, where we talk about council would support temporary commuter parking at Eltham Central Park, Eltham to off offset the anticipated loss of commuter car parking as a result of the project. Uh, so those words have been added in. And also the next uh, one is E, any changes to parking arrangements at Eltham Central Park, Eltham and Coventry Oval Diamond Creek to include consultation with football and cricket clubs, uh, the Eltham, Eltham Library in the case of uh, Eltham Central Park and, and other affected user groups. Um, the, the rest of the motion is as for the papers. And could I have a seconder, please, which is Councillor Clark. Back to you, Councillor Perkins. Um, so, look, apart from what's what's in the papers, uh, the motion, what, what I really want to do is is, is highlight, uh, first and foremost, what's happening at Diamond Creek, and perhaps Clark, uh, Councillor Clark can talk about uh, Eltham more broadly. But um, in Diamond Creek, we know that we're getting a, a duplication of uh, the rail line between Diamond Creek and, and, and Waddle Glen. Um, Council, over a, a, an extended period, has, has been arguing uh, that some works need need to be done to the the platform, the city band platform, potentially at uh, Diamond Creek to uh, provide uh, some disability services. Uh, we've requested uh, a crossing for the, the school children uh, accessing Diamond Creek East Primary School and, and Diamond Valley Secondary College, um, and that's just north of uh, the Diamond Creek train station. Uh, we see them as complementary works. You know, we, we've asked for the removal of the level crossing. We knew that was a, a, a bit of a big ask, but um, was, didn't hurt asking for that. Um, what we've now found, what we've come back with is uh, we're being told that the car parking at Diamond Creek train station uh, is is uh, going to be lost, you know, for the term of the construction phase. Now we assume uh, it'll be to put, you know, perhaps employees of, of, of the, the works or or contractors, vehicles or whatever else, but there won't be commuter car parking at Diamond Creek train station. So in line with that, what, what's been proposed to us by the Level Crossing Removal Authority is uh, to use some car parking uh, on Main Hurst Ridge Road. So they want to use the car parking uh, that's already provided for Diamond Creek East Primary School um, on Main Hurst Ridge Road, just uh, at Diamond Creek people would know it as, as uh, just uh, past food pantry. Um, but uh, it's, it's at car parking. Uh, that has only been there really since Community Bank Stadium was built. And it was put there to offset uh, the car parking that, that should have been required when Community Bank Stadium were, were put. So um, it's not an option. It's not an option for uh, Level Crossing Removal Authority to take over that car park. Um, likewise, uh, there's a proposal that they want to uh, put car parks, um, and I would say probably just throw gravel down on the, uh, the road reserve out the front of Mitre 10. Again, that's not an option. We know that that's not going to help Mitre 10. Um, that's that's not where cars should be parking. It's quite removed from 
uh, the train station. Uh, we know that, that Mitre 10 will lose their car park to commuter parking because people would rather uh, park in a, a formed and fully sealed car park, even if it is on private property, than, uh, than on something that's thrown together on Mainhurst Ridge Road. So uh, what, what the, uh, the motion calls for is for the Level Crossing Removal Authority to work with council and to get some sealed car parking around Coventry Oval. We've had parking precinct plans you know, that have been around for a long, long time um, indicating that there's over 200 car parks available around Coventry Oval, but um, part of that needs to be sealed. So really that's, uh, that's, that's what we call for um, in Diamond Creek, for, uh, for Level Crossing Removal Authority to sit down with officers, do some consultation um, with community, particularly with the uh, uh, football and the, the cricket clubs and, and the users of Coventry Oval and Elizabeth Street, um, and sort out some car parking around uh, Coventry Oval that is an offset for the loss of car parking at the Diamond Creek train station. Um, you know, I've said to officers that the car, any car parking around Coventry Oval needs to be orientated so it's nose in to the Oval, so it can be used at weekends. Um, you know, people going to watch the footy or the cricket, cricket can be sitting in their car, particularly in winter, um, and, and, and watching sports. So, you know, that car park would potentially be used, you know, certainly during, during the week uh, for commuter car parking, even, even when the, the car park has been uh, returned to commuter car parking, um, like when the works were, works were all finished. We're going to get more and more um, communities in Diamond Creek. Uh, the Diamond Creek train station car park is currently landlocked and we need the Level Crossing Removal Authority and, and, uh, and the government to, to really look, look to, um, to providing more commuter car parking in Diamond Creek. Um, it's provided uh, you know, plenty of money and, and, and uh, developing plans, I think, to do so in Eltham. Um, it's happened in Waddle Glen, it's happened in Hurstbridge, it needs to happen in, in Diamond Creek. Uh, I'll, I'll leave uh, discussion around Eltham for Councillor Clark, but really what, what the issues around the, the Diamond, I mean, around uh, the Eltham Oval, uh, the loss of car parking at Montmorency and uh, providing some offset car parking around um, uh, the Eltham Oval to offset the loss of car parking at Montmorency. But, you know, in terms of Diamond Creek, to me, the elephant in, in the room is we're losing car parking in Nillimbic and it's at Diamond Creek train station and we need Level Crossing Removal Authority to get serious and work with officers and, and for officers to to uh, facilitate that work, Level Crossing Removal Authority to get some car parking around Coventry Oval. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Perkins. Well done, Councillor Clark. Now, just before I start, can, can we just put the words up again, particularly the part two? I just want to check on one thing, whether it's included. <clears throat> So just stop there. Um, at the end of footpaths, before that, after that seri, semicolon, or before that semicolon, can we add the words, and I don't think Councillor Perkins is going to have a problem with this, plus kit landscaping. I just want to put some words in after the word footpaths at the end of four to add plus landscaping. Yep, there's no problem there. Um, Must be for me. Yeah, plus landscaping. Thank you. Um, Mayor, just on this resolution, uh, what we're basically trying to do is to leverage, I guess, the problem the state government has when they're going to not have a car park at Greensboro Station, not have a car park at Montmorency Station, to be able to assist in providing some overflow parking. It's inappropriate on the Old Shire office site. To park up there would be unsafe. Uh, we've not used it for the same purposes. But well, what we're seeking to do here is to achieve a better design outcome for our car park that we have around the football ground. It's effectively used for commuter parking now. Um, that is when you can go to work. Um, and indeed, I'm just throwing in the additional words for landscaping because when we actually put in hard stand, there are opportunities for additional landscaping that which we would, we would want to uh, maximise those opportunities for. This will assist in regularising car parking for the childcare cooperative for the University of the Third Age when they're commencing operations out of the, uh, their new facilities at the, the Football Cricket Club. And uh, if we design correctly, as Councillor Jumerick has already pointed out, uh, we'll, it'll assist also in the viewing lines onto the oval going forward. So we need to get this right. 
uh, but we'll, we'll garner and leverage some benefit of funding out of the government to get this done. We'll be putting some money towards this in any event, but maximising the, the benefits uh, going forward. I would say, and I remain concerned that even in our assistance to the government in this space, that there will be still inadequate car parking in this precinct when everybody gets back to work. We do know that there is an intention of government to build 300 more car parks around Eltham. Um, and I've got to say, we've lost 12 months uh, at least when they've dithered and not got on with it. Um, there are opportunities to build if they move the train stabling, additional car parking there. We've encouraged them to do that. Um, and I really would call on uh, the local member, Vicky Ward, to engage in this project in a serious way and to increase the car parking beyond what is actually even proposed in these words. Because in many respects, most of the car parking around these ovals is taken up in any event. So I'm not sure it will provide some additional overflow, but it certainly won't provide what is going to be lost in Greensboro and what is going to be lost in Montmorency. It needs to be far more, far more than that. Those of us that experienced the disaster when they rebuilt Bolton Street and nearly sent businesses broke, know that the coordination of government in this space is poor at best. And so, you know, I do call on the government to do far more than what they're doing here. Happy to support uh, some assistance in this space, but they have a responsibility not to have a negative impact on all the traders in Eltham Central and the residential base uh, from Bible Street and beyond. So this is not over. It goes some way towards it, and I'm happy to support that. But Vicky Ward's got an awful lot of work to do here if she's not going to end up with another disaster over the next two years. I commend Thank the result. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Any other councillors wish to speak? Councillor DeMary. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I was getting some feedback. Perhaps if people could mute their... Uh, mute their... Uh, screens thank you um i just want to reiterate the uh the thing about the the oval it's all right while we're considering um overflow car parking but this will have implications for years to come on viewing around eltham central uh if we get it right you can end up with you know two levels of uh car parking around there and the activities that go on on the oval and which are very keenly viewed by the uh the spectators of uh, the cricket club, the football club, the junior football club, uh, and even things like the Rotary Festival, etc. Uh, so, I really encourage that uh, the, the consultation is taken place with the Eltham Club, the football club, and all of the other members. Sorry, all the other users of the area. Um, yeah. Once it's put in, it will not be changed, and it will impact uh, you know those clubs forever. So uh, let's get people aware of it straight away and have input into how it is designed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Demerick. Any other councillors wish to speak? Councillor Brooker. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm at least partly relieved that the number one infrastructure project in Nillimbic won't be uh, Yangon Road Stage 2, because uh, clearly this is a massive public infra infrastructure investment in Nillimbic. And, you know, our role, as Councillor Perkins and Clark have said, is to anticipate and then manage the impacts on local residents of such a large project. And they've, you know, provided some commentary on that uh, about, you know, the car parking just one of the, in the officer report, one thing that maybe addresses that in an indirect way um, that's been ruled out of scope um, of the project um, is, the, um, is the bikeway between Greensboro Station that can connect at Sherbourne Road East and then connect on to the Eltham, um, the Eltham Trail. Um, you know, governments of all types do like to do strategic planning top documents that talk about modal shifts that is, um, you know, getting people out of cars and onto bikes or walking or other alternatives. And with the advancement of e-bikes, this seems to me that this becomes an actual practical possibility rather than just a theoretical hope um, that sounds good in, in a consultant's report, but everyone really thinks, yeah, modal shift, not likely. Um, you know, the shared trail between Greensboro train station, Sherbourne Road East, 
which would be accessible by residents in my end of the Shire, you know, would be a modest extra investment for a disproportionate, you know, public benefit and also address the very problems that have been talked about here for the last uh, few minutes from Councillor Perkins and Clark, well, by Councillor Clark in particular. It would be smart to do it now. We, we have to try and put that um, back into our or encourage submissions to the level crossing removal project by the Friday, the October the 2nd deadline. I notice here that they're saying they're doing targeted consultation. Generally, that's a euphemism for consultation with people who agree with us. So I really urge the community, if they want to get behind this project um, that's been ruled out of scope, um, a shared trail between Greensboro Station, Sherville Road East is, is, is uh, going to do many things at the same time. Um, so what I would say is uh, that this is actually, yeah, the state government, according to our paper, says it's part of the strategic cycling corridor. Well, if, you know, so that means the Department of Transport has it as a strategic cycling corridor. So that means we need them to talk to the, the, the Department of Transport, that is, to talk to the Level Crossing Removal Authority and get this project back in scope and back happening. Uh, that was all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Booker. Now the councillors wish to speak. If not, we'll put it to the vote. All those in favour? And thank you. That's three out of three. Two out of three. Three out of three. Our next item on the agenda is 171-20, the Bush Fire Mitigation Fire Prevention Works Program 2021. Can I have a mover for the motion, please, Councillor Ashton? Thank you. Um, recommendation as per the papers, please. Thank you, Councillor Ashton. Can I have a second to the motion, please? Councillor Perkins, Councillor Ashton. Thank you. Um, again, I'd like to thank the Municipal Fire Management Planning Committee for all their hard work in producing this document and the Chair, uh, Councillor Perkins, uh, together with our internal emergency management team and the infrastructure team that will actually action the plan. Um, this document is solely about the responsibilities of council with regard to roadsides, public open space and with the reserves it manages. It's good to read the rationale behind what determines a primary or secondary road. And I think it's really important that the community has this access to this document and understands the rationale behind what we do why we do it. Um, and also the potential treatments that each of these types of road attracts. I think it's also important to note that this schedule does not include Vic Road roads. I know they're not called Vic Roads anymore, but I think general public still know them as that. Um, and that these roads are some of the primary roads throughout Norwich, particularly in the rural areas. Um, they are not the responsibility of council, although we do liaise with Vic Roads, particularly on the slashing of grass behind barriers and passing on residents' concern with regard to sight lines and hazardous trees. So we're always um, wel welcome any comments from residents with regard to all roads in Nolambic. Um, this council has worked substantially to increase the budget for these works and vastly reduce the timing of the cycle of works that we're responsible for. Um, our community survey continually lists bushfire as a major concern for our residents, both rural and urban. And we're endeavouring to do works that may slightly reduce the risk to our residents and emergency services during bushfire season. We're very limited by state government legislation with regard to removal of vegetation and the need to protect ecosystems and biodiversity. So we're able to slash grass, box clear, assess and potentially remove hazardous trees and reduce fuel loads by woody weave removal. This is the construct in which we can work and I think we're doing the best that we possibly can under the current guidelines. I know that this report states that planned works are to be completed by the end of December 2020, depending on weather conditions. This may be an issue with already strong growth and high levels of rainfall predicted. Slashing twice a year is financially impossible as the preference to wait till grass is occurred is, it keeps the costs down and they only have to slash once. I'm very concerned that this December completion date may not be, may, may be as late as February this year and would hope that the next council may consider this issue prior to Christmas. 
Also, although all our neighbourhood safer places have all been reassessed as compliant, as we face another fire season, we still ignore those places that rural people evacuated to on Black Saturday. These are not bushfire places of last resort. We have none in the rural areas. Here I'm talking about sporting ovals and areas close to CFA stations. They have neither had their surrounding fuel loads assessed or their infrastructure hardened to up to provide protection. Despite the leave early policy, which I think we all agree with, human nature is such that where some people sought shelter in the past, they will go to again. So I might hope that a future council might investigate this further. Thank you, I support the recommendation that council notes the two items. Sorry, my bad. Thank you, Councillor Ashton. Over to you, Councillor Perkins. Yeah, thank you. So, um, uh, you know, we've got a list of priority work that's been priority works that have been identified by the um, the fire planning uh, fire management planning committee um, in consultation with with local brigades primarily and and also our um, fire prevention officers. So, um, primary roads uh, and secondary roads uh, treatments, including slashing box clearance. Proactive tree assessment, woody weed removal. Um, we have seven neighbourhood safer places. Um, really, they came about probably about 2010, 2011, after, after Black Saturday um, 2009. And it was around that time that the budget for um, uh, bushfire mitigation works went up from about, around about three or 400,000 to about 800,000. I think it now sits at about a million dollars. So um, there are substantial monies expended. Um, for the bushfire mitigation uh, works program. Um, you know, just looking at the, the places of last resort, the neighbourhood safer places, um, I was just having a, a look at them there. Of the, of the seven, four are around the Plenty Gorge, yeah? And, uh, and, and those, that four, so four out of seven are around the Plenty Gorge, um, the Diamond Hills Oval, uh, the Yarrabat Park Golf Course, uh, the Colandina Reserve in Greensboro, and uh, the Yarrambat Park Golf Course. Um, you know, it has long been identified um, that area as, as, as high risk, not, not just because of the fuel load, but also because of the number of people that live in very close proximity to it. Um, the Plenty Gorge has always been um, something that, that is very, very concerning, uh, not just to, you know, the people living adjacent, but, but certainly with the fire services and, and anyone that understands anything about, about fire, um, Plenty, Plenty Gorge has always uh, been a bit of a scary, a scary place. Uh, and I had a phone call today from one of the residents um, living in Bella Vista Road, and 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 I would hope that um, a future council or, or even the administration, in the meantime, um, works a, a little bit harder to have a look at um, the pine trees along Bella Vista Road. Um, there was a, a, a letter written by the CFA to uh, to the CEO uh, ten years ago, um, indicating that the, the local CFA weren't happy about traveling down traveling down Bella Vista Road um, because of these these huge pine trees that are sitting in the council road reserve. Um, and I went and had a look at them today. And yeah, they, they certainly are, are very big, very, very close close to the road, dropping lots and lots of pine needles. Um, you know, it's certainly like an assessment uh, of those those trees, not just around bushfire issues, but also around, you know, they're essentially weeds from what, from what I can tell. Um, they don't fit in with the local neighborhood character. It's a lovely area. These things um, stick out. Uh, they, they drop heaps and it's pine needles um, on properties all around. So. That's, that's an area I'd like us to uh, perhaps take another look at. Um, the residents aren't going away. Um, hopefully I won't be either. Thanks very much. Any other, Councillor Clark. <coughs> yeah, thank you, Mayor. I just want to raise another area as well. Uh, and that is the Parks Victoria um, land which basically goes along the Yarra Corridor uh, from Eltham to Research. Um, I had cause to drive there uh, only uh, about a week or two weeks ago. Um, and it was just after, I wanted to have a look just after those very heavy winds we had only about a week ago. And I was surprised to see how many trees had uh, been blown over and collapsed right through that precinct. Um, and the amount of debris which was there, it, it, it looked like 
It was just waiting for a fire to, to declare it. So can I just encourage officers to talk to the CFA to review that precinct as part of our bushfire mitigation works. Um, it is of major concern. Um, clearly SES had been through and just cut up trees which had crossed the road, um, but that had just been thrown back as, as undergrowth. So it is of a real concern. It's a dramatic change even in the last 10 days and just shows how much we need to keep on top of those areas. And it's not an area that, it's an area, uh, probably the area that I have greatest concern in the period that I've been on the council in my ward because of its, its lack of maintenance um, along that journey. So I can ask officers if they can make a particular note of that, make a visitation with the CFA and see what can be done before we get into the fire season. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Clark. Any other councillors wish to speak? No, nope, we'll put it to the vote. All those in favour? And that is carried. Thank you. Our next item is OCM 17120, the Whittingham Circuit Greensboro public notification on proposed sale. Can I have a mover for the motion? Now, just before we address, can, I, can I just ask the question? I don't know how many others have got the problem, but I've got very substantial feedback. I, very, very hard to hear you and others. Have others got that problem or is it just unique to me? Have you got more than one device open? Because that no. one, no? No, nobody else has got the problem. Thank you. I, I, just... I, 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 I had it. It's improved in the last few minutes. I have it and improves when people, um, everyone else turns off their speakers. So I think it's feedback through. No, back to you, Count, uh, where am I at? Councillor Brooker. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Whittingham Circuit, Greensboro. I think it's the ultimate irony in, in many respects that this motion uh, appears tonight. Uh, some might describe it as a cruel and unusual punishment that um, I'm moving this motion. I do think the Geneva Convention should have something to say about you know, torture um, and that this whole precinct has caused me personally um, over, over the last years going back to 2007. But that is when um, Friends of Apollo Parkways was formed, um, which I was a foundation member. A local community group opposed to the sale of public open space, which was to be sold. 176 lot housing subdivision put in the area we know now around the Civic Drive. The demolition of the current ca uh, council building, the relocation to 895 Main Road, Eltham, where a new civic centre would be constructed utilising the $20 million proceeds um, to fund that project, 100% of that construction uh, coming you know, from the sale of the land around Civic Drive. Can you speak um, item? You need to talk about the um, motion, Councillor Brooker. I'm, that's exactly what I'm talking about. This motion is, is for the sale of this property. We haven't seen the motion on the screen yet. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not going to read all that out, but it's it's to resolve, you know, to commence the process. Okay. Um, Sorry, three, all of okay, those... Can I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Ashton. Okay, carrying on. Um, look, the major difference now um, compared to 2012, which is when the original intention to sell was um, passed by the council. Uh, eight, eight, and two third, eight and a third years later, uh, we're proposing an update on that intention to sell. Well, why do we have to do that? Um, is that because the sale process uh, has been advertised twice and sold twice and deposits have been collected twice, but settlement has failed to occur twice. So the council is ho hoping that third time's a charm and that we will go out with a substantially different um, look than what we've had the previous times. Uh, previously, as uh, the group that I'm a member of are well aware, there was a very prescriptive um, house and land package really with each lot associated to each house. Um, whether that was a factor or not in, the, in it failing to settle, 
uh, that, that was in the words of the, the prospective purchasers, that was the reason, although that was well known to them when they made their purchase. So I do think their due diligence was lacking uh, in, in those cases. So the first tranche of the subdivision has been offered for sale. It has subsequently been sold. Uh, so what we're wanting to do now is uh, go out and form the public again, because it's been eight and a third years since we first advertised our intention to do so, uh, to sell that property. Now, I would say in that time back back into the time of 2007, 2008, uh, which is why it is so ironic for me personally, is that the group that I was a member of, we worked our guts out to prevent that sale. We, I, I worked my guts out to prevent that sale. We did absolutely everything. We, in our little humble community group, we made submissions, we asked questions, we conducted community meetings, we created hard copy petitions. We held rallies at the at all that type of activity that we've uh, actually become a little familiar with. Now, I flagged, um, you know, spoken to a number of residents over the weekend about where do we go now? Where do we go now, given our implacable opposition to this project from 13 years ago? and from seven years ago. Uh, well, the difference is the construction has been completed. The services have been installed. We now have electricity, gas, sewerage, telephone, um, all of those services that you need for the construction of a subdivision. The council has spent $2.1 million on that subdivision. So the issue um, for the local residents is going to be what really is our is our position and certainly in the position of the people that i have spoken to and uh, and i have to say in a i think very selfless way they've had regard for the shire of nilambi they have actually considered something a little bigger than themselves in this process the people that i've spoken to and they have said, okay, um, let's go out for consultation, let's see what comes back. And what will, because the biggest concern is the quality, the look and the feel of the proposed subdivision and what, how that is going to look with a potential purchaser. Thank so you. that is what I will be following very closely in this iteration of this process. Thank you. Over to you, Councillor Ashton. Thank you. Um, so you are supporting the motion, Councillor Brooker? I just think no. I'm, I made that very clear that the residents I had spoken to and that I personally had thought that the interests of Nillenbeck were paramount in this area and that I certainly support an intention to go out for sale. Okay. That is, that is what okay. I'm saying. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, look, this has been something we've inherited and it's come up repeatedly. It, it, it's 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 never straightforward, and um, you can't apportion blame. These things occur, and uh, we are trying to resolve it as quickly as possible. And um, I think Spartacus moment for you and your community that they have um, seen the dilemma that we're in, and will support um, also the other residents of Nilambik to resolve this. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I, I support the recommendation and hope that we can resolve it as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ashton. Any other councillors wish to speak? Um, I'll, 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 I'll your hand up, Councillor Perkins. Thank you, Councillor. Oh, Perkins. sorry. Was there anyone else? Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, look, happy to support uh, Councillor Brooker here. Uh, this has been going along a long, long, long time, and, and I know when I joined council in 2010, um, it's, it was well advanced back then. Um, Councillor Clarkson uh, was the ward councillor back then in 2010. Um, she opposed it. Uh, Councillor Klein opposed it. Councillor, you know, it, it has been opposed by the ward councillor um, throughout throughout time. Um, you know, we've got to this 
this point, uh, there's been other developments that, that council have done. I know in just very close to my ward, um, Henry Arthur Drive is just, just south of the windmill. Um, yeah, that was council land that uh, council subdivided. Um, it was expedited fairly quickly and, and, and people living there quite ha happily now. Um, when, it, when it happens right, it, it, it can be a good process, but obviously this has dragged out for a long, long time. It's been contentious right from the word go. Um, it would be good to to uh, to be rid of it, but we need to get the best outcome we can. So, look, I'm, I'm happy to support the motion. And, and uh, yeah, I sympathise with uh, Councillor Brooke and the work that you've been doing over many, many years uh, on this, many years before you even joined council. So, you know, keep up the good work. Thank you, Councillor Perkins. Any other councillors wish to speak to the item? If not, we'll put it to the vote. All those in favour? And that is carried. Thank you, councillors. Our next item is 17220, the Financial Hardship Policy COVID-19 Pandemic Event. Can I have a mover for the motion, Councillor Clark? Is there a seconder? Can I have a seconder for the motion? For Councillor Perkins, over to you, Councillor Clark. Uh, Mayor, clearly this is a policy that we don't want to have to have in the sense that uh, we'd much rather we didn't have a COVID-19 pandemic uh, and particularly one which has dragged on for so long into the second wave, having the dramatic impact on our businesses and our residential rate payers right throughout the Shire. But uh, in short, um, it is a, a small component of what we can do as a Shire to support our rate payers, to endorse uh, this particular a protocol to assist with interim measures uh, for the declaration of the pandemic and event. And I, I look forward to the time when we no longer have to enact it and uh, our residents are back to much greater normality and um, enjoying lives as they used to do in our great shire. Uh, but I commend the resolution and, and I, I thank the council for seeking to support the residents. I'm sure we'd probably like to do more to be honest, but uh, uh, we need to again, continue to try and live within our means. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Councillor Perkins. Um, look, I won't say much, but just that this is an extension, um, extends the um, interest-free period to 31st of March next year. Um, it'll be reviewed at that time, and I dare say, um, you know, extended if, if need be. Um, just see what happens between now and then. Um, it's, it's, it is a small measure, uh, but it's important that, uh, that this policy be extended now, so I'm happy to support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Perkins. Any other councillors wish to speak? Councillor Demerick. Um, I'm happy to support the motion. Uh, I think it's a, a small thing we can do. Um, I am very pleased, uh, you know, while it's a, a tough time, by the resilience of the community uh, during this time and the efforts that they are going to to uh, try and keep a little bit of cheer in the place. So. Uh, I particularly noticed Joan Deverson and putting her chooks around everywhere. Um, but uh, it's also, as we look forward to coming out of this, um, you know, I think it's important that we work out how we are going to come out as a community and to uh, get back to the things we love. While uh, the other thing which has been really notable is the uh, open space around the place. Um, you know, if you go out any uh, Saturday or Sunday morning, the people making use of the local areas because they can't go too far. And it is a, a wonderful thing, the, uh, the amount of areas we do have in the, in the Shire for walking and recreation. So uh, commend the thing, but also commend the community for their uh, resilience during this period. Thank you, Councillor Demerick. Any other speakers? Councillor Booker. Thank you. Uh, look, yes, just to, uh, I endorse the extension of the policy. Uh, and I do know that council, um, when we adopted this policy in April, uh, we had only 170 res residents apply for a deferral um, for the May rates notice. It may be different six months notice. We've got the income support measures um, from the government uh, that have been introduced are going to be changed uh, from September the 30th. That could have an impact. So it's uh, it certainly, uh, an important policy, I think, for Nillenbeck, but, you know, I think Councillor Dimerick summed it up very well in terms of, you know, the last six months of, of what, what we've had to put up with. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Brooker. I'll have to take your words about the Chooks, Councillor Jamerit, because it's outside my five kilometre zone. Um, if no other councillor wish to speak, we'll put it to the vote. All those in favour? And that is carried. Thank you. Our next item is 17320, the Temporary and Community Advertising Signage Policy. Can I have a mover for the motion, please? Move Councillor the resolution Mark. there. And a seconder, please. Councillor Ashton. Back to you, Councillor Clark. Uh, Mayor, this policy has been out for extensive community consultation. At the end of the day, it's one of those policies you're never going to get unanimous positions on. There are people in many respects at either extremes. There are those that wouldn't have a sign in, in uh, anywhere in the Shire if they could help it. And we did certainly get submissions from those people who would prefer not to even have allow businesses to put a sign on their property. Uh, but essentially, we've gone back out to... Uh, community consultation at more recent times just to be able to go over with some of the community groups who hold some of the larger events which provide enjoyment and uh, great fun for adults and children alike um, just to make sure that this policy provides uh, the, the focus the detail which enables them to be able to ensure that the ratepayers and the residents know when these are events on and get adequate information um, and so we found that, um, that we did require some additional changes. Those have been incorporated into this particular policy. Um, and I think it's, it's now quite a good outcome. Um, it, it equally does seek to control um, what you might call for smaller events, more intermittent advertising, so that there is a more standardized format, greater clarity, so that people don't have to squint to see what's on the sign as they drive by. Um, greater, I guess, design control over its format. Um, and that I hope will generate um, broader support within the community and enable still the groups to be able to hold uh, functions and let people know what's going on. It does for the first time also introduce some costs and other measures that sit around real estate boards and the nature of people of real estate agents putting out boards in our local communities. The policy aligns with other municipalities uh, abutting and, and uh, a bit further afar. Um, it's not, it's really a matter of trying to control and utilize those in, in the best way for community um, advantage. Just wanted to touch briefly, I guess, on uh, one of, by some measure, a little bit more contentious has been the banner program, um, which has now been installed in Eltham. It is very well supported by the traders uh, in an effort to enable them to. Um, encourage people to shop local and also an opportunity to be able to focus on the seasons of the year, whether it's Christmas, whether it's Easter, Anzac Day, whatever. Um, and so it's an important part of, of, of that fabric in ensuring that uh, the community, I, I guess it does add a, a level of decoration and, and interest in, in that, uh, that street. Um, it's not new in the concept of doing that. We've already had banners along the um, the main street for many, many years, which uh, are attached to the light poles. And there was a massive problem in, in changing them over. They became very tatty. They became less and less relevant over time. Uh, and the nature of trying to interchange or fix them was very, very expensive for the council. So the, what's deemed the banner program, uh, which enables about three or about four, I think it is, or five, um, medium lip height flagpoles with banners on them means we're able to remove the other centre median banners which have been there for many, many years. Um, so for those to suggest that this is a whole new program of advertising in the main street is somewhat ingenuous to say the least. Um, but it certainly is going to be a much safer outcome for those that change them um, and indeed provide some interest where those banners are now more related to where the retailing is actually occurring. They're not going to be utilised for the purposes of advertising per se. So, you know, the, the local baker's delight can't come and say shop here. But they're about community events. And some of those events may even be in other parts of the Shire to recognise if a Waddle Festival's on in Hurst Bridge. There's no reason equally they can't be used for that purpose. I think it's a well-rounded and considered policy at the end of the day, and I commend uh, as moving forward on that matter, as I said, no matter how much we go out and talk to others, you'll never get a unanimous view, but this is supported as broadly by those groups 
who do create the fun and excitement in our community and putting on community events. And they're the people that matter to me. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Councillor Ashton. Look, I, I think as somebody that has organised community events in the past, it, it will be so much easier. People can get sent this document. They can work out in advance what, they, what, what, what suits them, what fits with their program. I think we have to remember this is temporary signage. It's non-commercial and it's there to support community. And it, all those groups that volunteer, put in hours and hours and rely on people turning up, um, and that money usually comes back to the community. And so I think the least that we can do as a council is offer them a streamlined concierge, temporary signage policy. And I think that's what we've done. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ashton. Any other councillors wish to speak? Councillor Brooker. Yeah, I'd like to just propose an amendment, uh, Mayor. And I don't think we, we can maybe get it up on the screen, but really if we can uh, um, delete the banner section of the policy from the temporary and community advertising signage policy um, to delete the banner portion of that, um, that's what I propose as an amendment. Thank you, Councillor Brooker. Um, Do you have a second? Councillor Jamerick. Um, Councillor Brooker. Sorry, okay. what is the resolution? To delete the what? to delete the banner section of the policy. So is that an item four? To adopt it? temporary and ad advertising signage, yes, to delete the banner section contained within the policy. It's called the Nilovic Banner Program. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe if that's what it's called, maybe that's what it should say. That if we call it the Nillenbeck Banner Pro Pro Program, yeah. I think that's very clear. Is that clear to you, Councillor Clark? Well, it's better than what you had before, which was nothing. Okay, well, so I, I'll take that as a yes. Um, look, this, the whole construct of, of the new flagpoles was a very curious one. It was designated a renewal type of expenditure over what previously existed. So it was not construed to be new or an upgrade. Um, it never came to councillors as a kind of a part of a capital expenditure budget. Uh, this, it was cost around $9,000 per flagpole. And part of the planning permit um, for the flagpoles was the size of the banners, which is one of the problems we had. Um, I think anyone who has seen the banners would come to one conclusion. They are underwhelming. They actually look a little like amateur hour. Um, they are just too small to capture what was the ostensible purpose, which was to add, and I quote from the document, vitality to Main Street. Um, if, so I think what the banner flags do as currently, you know, as currently conduct, constructed, they, they do the opposite of that. Councillor Clark says they um, have, have the um, support of the traders. Um, you know, I think what the traders support are certain uh, messaging around shop local. And that, that is what they support. Where that comes about, I don't think they're so much interested in as, as the general messaging around that, that broad subject. So, you know, the only way that the, the, the banner flags can be changed is if, um, we get a new planning permit and change the size. Now, I would not support that either. I think that that's, although that would be something that you could consider and that is something that you could look at. But right now, the, banner, the banners themselves don't achieve the ostensible objective that they are designed to do. They, they have no purpose. They're, they do not do what they are intended to do. And so for that reason I think you know we, we ought, ought not have have them until we figure out the best way to use them if there is a best way to use them but right now we've got the worst of both worlds we've got inadequate banners um, that that don't achieve their purpose so I don't support the banner program um, that's that's it really thank you thank you councillor Booker councillor Demerick <coughs> uh, along with 
Councillor Brooke, I, I don't support the Bannon program. Um, one of the sort of guidelines for it, it's, it's a decorative way of, uh, for, it's a decorative uh, aspect for our streets. I don't think so. I, I would hate to see it rolled out to, uh, you know, Main Street, Panton Hill and, uh, and uh, up through Hurstbridge and, and into uh, St Andrews. Um, you know, I think it, it's probably, banners are a, are a 1950s way of uh, decorating and advertising. Um, I think we could probably do better. So uh, I just don't support that part of this project. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jamerick. Any other councillors wish to speak? Councillor Perkins. Yeah, thank you. Very happy to support the amendment because if this amendment gets up, I'll actually support uh, the policy um, overall because this is the only issue that I have with it. I think there's been, I'll, I'll, perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll talk to the rest of the policy later on, but just in terms of the amendment, the Olympic Banner Program, I've never supported. Um, banners were put in Diamond Creek before I got on council. I don't think they're a good look. Um, I, I don't support them in Diamond Creek and I've, I've never supported um, the going up, up in Eltham. Um, it, it came as a bit of a surprise uh, when I saw that we'd actually award ourselves a planning permit to put these things up and found uh, the $40,000 $40, or whatever it cost, um, $50,000, I'm not sure, we found the money um, to put these flagpoles up. So it did come as a surprise to me. Um, uh, I think there's there's a, a submission from a very popular and well-known local resident, um, and, and he he talks about the, the flags. The flags proposed for Eltham are grotesque. They won't add vitality. They will add to visual pollution and are a waste of money at a time when council should be preparing for other priorities, like dealing with a major drop in revenue. They will give the impression of a used car yard and cheapen the activity centre around Eltham, given that many on this council may not be there after the election. Why waste time and money on these tawdry decorations? Um, now that submission was five months ago, uh, 27th of April, 2020 by um, one of my favorite TV characters, really Clive from Neighbours. But um, look, I think he, he sums it up really, really well. And, uh, and, and I think, you know, the, the, the banner program, you know, if, if, it, if it does get up, it's not gonna live very long. So let's just uh, put it to bed now and, uh, and delete the banner program uh, from the temporary and community advertising signage policy. Um, the, the top line in the, in the program that sort of says, banner flags are an effective way of decorating activity centers in Nilambic. Like, you know, no thanks. Thanks very much. Um, the, the real look and feel and, and local charm of our activity centers in our townships are, are what we want to re, uh, retain. We don't want grotesque banner flags that serve as decoration. Decoration is for Christmas time, perhaps. Uh, the rest of the time, it's a no thanks. So um, I'm with uh, Clive. Thank you, Councillor Perkins. Any other councillors wish to speak? Councillor Clark. I wish to speak. I wish to speak against the amendment, Mayor. Um, look, some of the commentary is just blatant politicking. It's blatant politicking because uh, Councillor Perkins seeks to support one of the candidates who made a submission. Is one of the candidates in the Wingrove ward election, which so far in every document I've seen him issue, he hasn't got anything right so far. So I suspect. He didn't get this one right as well. Uh, Councillor Perkins has been there for 10 years and hates the banners in Diamond Creek. And you know what he's done to get rid of them? Same as he's done on a lot of stuff, nothing. Absolutely zero. He They're not my banners. He could have sought to remove the banners, but no, he's done nothing. And why did he not do that? Why would you say he did nothing? Because they're the traders. Because the traders thought they were a good idea in their local area. And that's why he shut up about the matter in Diamond Creek, because he didn't want to offend the traders. Equally, Councillor Brooker, who is consultation, zero. Conversation with traders, zero. Conversation with anybody else, zero. So the traders who have worked with us on this program for some months, total projects cost less than $10,000. Not the stupid numbers that Councillor Perkins deliberately seeks to deceive the meeting with. Um, this is an outcome which is a lesser cost than the, the changeover of the banners that we were having there on an ongoing basis for years and years and years, which were dilapidated and had to be pulled down because they basically had their day. This is a program now 
where they can safely be adjusted. There are actually lax banners, less um, total area of signage than there were before. But no one wants to deal in the facts. What some of these councillors, the three that we've just heard from, want to deal with is the politics. Don't deal in supporting traders in a difficult COVID period. Uh, don't deal in supporting residents who might want to mention that it's Anzac Day and put a, a banner up to reflect that or Christmas or other religious festivals. Don't talk about the facts and the nature of how the community actually wants to do something. Just play the politics. I would hope that we actually might support what um, is being supported in writing by our traders who have worked through these particular issues and not get caught up in the silly politics of some. The only comment I would suspect and I would agree with that I think the banners could be a bit larger, uh, but that's going to be a matter for others over the journey to find the right size as, as uh, we've only got a holding banner in place now. The long term program will roll out. Um, but I don't think that the amendment is either reasonable nor, nor supported by the traders of the area who are doing it tough. I actually think it could be a good thing to look at in Hurstbridge, but I'll let that to the traders of Hurstbridge and other locations throughout the Shire if that's what they want to do. But allow the traders of Nillenbeck and some of the resident groups, some, some of the trader groups and residents to continue on with what they want to do in their local Thank community you. without the political interference. Any other councillors wish to speak? Councillor Brooker, haven't you already spoken? Yeah, well, just, yeah, I've, I've just a, a question. It seems, and I just want some clarification, sorry, from Councillor Clark. He's, he seems to be saying that he, he thinks the, the banners are too small. So by definition, he doesn't support the banner policy. Is, is that correct? No, it's not, Councillor Brooker. What I'm suggesting is if others into the future believe they should be larger, then it's up to them to move resolutions and get a planning permit to make them larger. That's something the traders will look at over the journey. This policy is a good policy. It's not excessive and should stay as it is. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Um, if Councillor Ashton doesn't want to wish to speak, I wish to speak against the motion. First of all, Hurst Ridge already has banners. We have stunning, beautiful banners with kookaburras on them, um, which have been used for Christmas and other occasions. We're, we're also looking at having some with wattles and things like that we can bring out. We've got portable poles at the moment, which quite frankly are fraught with danger. So to have some permanent ones, I think would be a great idea into the future. Um, as Councillor Clark says, this is about community events such as Anzac Day, Remembrance Day, things like the Jazz Festival. Um, and again, considering where we are at the moment in COVID and the effect that that has had on local businesses throughout the state, especially um, metropolitan Melbourne, we should be doing everything humanly possible to help these people. It's also been um, quite a well-known fact amongst the councillors as we were briefed by staff that the current banners are way undersized, very underwhelming, and that any future banners were going to be larger. Um, all councillors know that th that was just simply a holding banner. Um, so the size of the next ones will be larger. So that's why I will be voting against this motion. So I'll now put it to the vote, all those in favour of Councillor Brooker's motion. All those against. And under clause 45 of the governance rule meeting procedure, I will Can I get division? I haven't finished, Councillor Perkins. Oh, um, sorry, just nice do the casting vote then. We'll division once you've done that. Against it. Be really nice to be not interrupted. Um, so that means for against. So all those in favour of Councillor Brooker's motion, Councillor Perkins, Councillor Brooker, Councillor Jamerick, all those against. Councillor Egan, Councillor Ashton, Councillor Clark, and I use my casting vote, so that vote is now carried. We now go back to the substantive motion on the table. And that was moved by Councillor Clark, seconded, seconded by Councillor Ashton. Um, Blaga, can you remind me where we were up to when Councillor Brooker moved sure. his amendment? So we've had speakers of Councillor Clark and Councillor Ashton. No other councillors have spoken to the substantive motion. Right. So I'll now open up the floor to other councillors who wish to speak to the motion. 
Councillor Brooker. Yeah, well, I would just say I'm speaking against the motion. Uh, unfortunately, because um, the banner program remains in it, you know, but for that, I, I would be supporting it. So, you know, there seems to be some dispute even on the other side. Councillor Clark doesn't like the size of the, the banners. Councillor um, Egan doesn't like the size of the banners. The size of the banners can't be changed without a planning permit. It's a curious thing to me that you would adopt a policy where you both object to the size of the banners uh, for, for, for reasons that you think you they need to be bigger. Now, it's, you know, I think that's, that says everything about this, this particular policy, that it's actually flawed, that you actually don't even believe in the banners as they are currently constructed. So, you know, that's, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Booker. Councillor Perkins, did you have your hand up? Over to you. Yes, um, thank you. Um, look, it's a, it's a bit of a shame, uh, really, that uh, this policy didn't, didn't get, um, it's not going to get clear passage for you know through council for very long. So um, it's unfortunate. It, it is so unpopular in in Eltham, uh, particularly the Banner program, that 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 I don't think it's going to live uh, for very long. Um, there was a clear opportunity to make this a policy and 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 uh, one that that could be used uh, you know for many years. I I, I can't see that that happening. Um, you know, if Council Clark uh, had have hung around, you know, stayed with the VFL for a little bit longer. Rather than, than attempting to go and and uh, and play in the in the big time again, uh, you you might have been able to uh, help see this policy through um, to implementation. But you know the Nilambic Banner Program is a dead duck. Um, this policy I can't support. Uh, you know broadly the policy. There's concern about the policy uh, as a bigger issue um, encourages signage rather than than, than trying to. Um, uh, minimise it, and that was uh, Jim Connor uh, presented that to us last week. And I think, you know, Jim's words on that issue were were very, very wise. Uh, so it was well worth listening to. He he, he put that uh, the significant changes that have been recently made to the policy after uh, speaking with eighty three community groups um, should have uh, went back out for another round of community consultation. Uh, I'm not saying that needed to happen. I'm saying we just needed to listen to community. The consistent message from community from the word go uh, was about uh, the Nilambic Banner program and uh, it's inappropriate and it, it, it should have been deleted. Uh, Councillor Brook has tried his best uh, with, with, uh, with as much as support as, as I could, could offer, but obviously not enough. Um, so I won't be supporting this motion. I'm sorry, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Councillor Perkins. Any other councillors wish to speak? If not, we'll put it. Did you want to write a reply, Councillor Clark? Uh, unfortunately, just briefly, just so I can, Councillor Brooker can hear the same thing for the third time. Um, I'm not unhappy with the banner program. I'm not unhappy with the banner size for the third time, Councillor Brooker. So don't misrepresent, misrepresent me. Um, if others believe they should be larger, then that's up to them, but it's not really related so much to this program as it is basically to seek a, an amendment to the planning permit. Others can, and, and that will come as a result of traders who have a look at it and will make some judgments about that. They will come back to the council and hopefully um, my successor they will talk to uh, and my successor will listen to the traders and they will work those matters through. Um, Councillor Egan and I spent the time of the committee of three, which Councillor Perkins was to be a part of, but didn't attend a meeting of, which was to talk to the other uh, groups to go through the second round of, of consultations. We listened carefully to all of those groups and some of them were in Councillor Perkins' ward and they sought uh, changes to the policy and we've brought those through in these particular amendments. Um, there were none of the people in that second round of consultation who had any concern about uh, the banner program component of it. In fact, quite the reverse, a number of them were simply asking questions. Can they utilize it if they're running a function in other parts of the Shire, which we obviously said, yes, is appropriate. Um, so, you know, th there was broad support out of the second group. There has only really been one orchestrated outcome and that was through, you know, the community group who, who lacks transparency and lacks any public meeting known otherwise as GCAG. Um, and yes, their membership um, 
well, can't call them membership because there's only seven people who are actually members, uh, but their Facebook page uh, certainly tried to generate um, some commentary around this, but even then it was very minimal. Um, these, this concept does have, is a good idea, as is the whole program. And it's, it's disappointing that people are playing politics with it at the 11th hour. Um, it's not gonna help your vote, Council Brookie, you need a far bit more help than you're gonna get from ECAG, but I commend the resolution. We'll now put it to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? Are you waving to somebody, Councillor Cleggins? Um, and again, under clause 45 of the Governance Rule meeting procedures, I exercise my casting vote and vote for the amendment. So that is carried. Did you want a division, Councillor Perkins? A division, please. Thank you. All those in favour, Councillor Egan, Councillor Ashton, Councillor Clark, all those against, Councillor Perkins, Councillor Brooker and Councillor Demerick. Thank you, Councillor. You're muted, Councillor. Oh, you. Sorry, we're going to take a short break just for 10 minutes. So we will see everybody back here at exactly five to nine. Thank you. Park master plan concept. Can I have a mover for the motion, please? Councillor Ashton. Thank you. Can you put the motion up, please, Blogger? Thank you. Um, so we've got an amended motion. Um, sorry, an alternate motion. Blather, sorry. Won't be a moment, everybody. We'll just get it up on the screen. Yes, yeah, so I've asked that we have an alternate motion or an alternate recommendation um, that council endorses the concept. I won't say plan, but the concept as a formative product of a potential master plan, subject to the following changes, retention of the mural viewing platform, improved viewing options, and continual use of the mural viewing platform as a site to play, display information, and no reference to the removal of the fire spotter cabin be included in this document. Um, endorses officers to proceed with the master plan phase of the project based on this concept, including preparing a draft master plan for public review and completing the draft master plan for adoption at a future council meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ashton. Can I have a second for the motion? Councillor Clark, I presume. Back to you, Councillor Ashton. Thank you. Um, tonight, we've been asked to endorse this concept um, and that's to agree that we are generally, and I'll say generally, moving in the right direction. Um, also to endorse officers to proceed with a master plan. This will go out for public review and further stakeholder input. It will then go up to the next council to adopt or not, as it so chooses, the master plan once it has heard public submissions. So I need to reassure you that a final master plan is a long way off yet, and that there will be additional opportunity for all to provide their input into the final master plan when it comes before the next council. Any plan that has as its subject such an iconic and well-loved site needs to ensure that its outcomes provide for a net community benefit. And that is why I'm hoping the changes I've made tonight to the concept recommendations will guarantee that certain items which are of concern to the community and myself do not proceed into the draft master plan and are firmly shelved now tonight. I cleanly read the results from the participating Olympic survey which described how the park is used, by whom and how often, and most importantly of all, why it is valued. The main message I took away was that the majority of the community value it as it is and did not want or ask for a huge amount of change. As the ward councillor for four years, my ambitions and those of the majority of users have been very modest. To get the grass cut regularly, mend the broken benches and chain fence, tidy up the lavender. 
More recently, the dilapidation of the caretaker's cottage, the stone one that is, was noted and 36,000 set aside to fix it. It's a very useful storage space and holds the original ladder steps that went up to the tower. An improved and safer entrance to the park has also been noted. And again, um, even under the previous council, these drawings were made and we will get a budget about 160,000 for that. The cedar trees were starting to drop limbs and again, sadly would need to be removed. They have had a long and very illustrious life up there and a part of that heritage um, of that site. But again, um, that would be quite a costly thing, but it will need to be done at some stage. However, there were various ideas and other improvements suggested for the site. And without a master plan of some description, funding opportunities could not be pursued. But as I say, be careful what you wish for. The idea of a master plan was never muted as a complete revision of the site, just a statement of heritage, purpose, and landscaping options for the future. The site is not just of interest to the wider community, but also the various groups who have had long time connections with it, such as the Friends of Kangaroo Grand War Memorial Park and the Nillambit Reconciliation Group, who have both done active work and held events there before and since I've been on this council. I'm also aware of the status and importance which the Montmorency Eltham RSL sub-branch hold in this site, and that to them and the wider community, it is very significant in that it holds a war memorial tower dedicated to those that served this country and made the ultimate sacrifice. Also, the various legal, lo local historical societies have a strong custodial interest in this site. The concept presented to us is aspirational and inspirational, and it very cleverly tackles some of the current limitations of the site, particularly those of access and egress, additional parking to the tower from the car park all of which I have believe have been considered very thoughtfully. The retention of the mural viewing platform is important. Its shape has bungled the eagle, looking over the valley where the eagles fly and reminding us of the Aboriginal people who would have also looked over that valley is very significant. It offers shelter from rain and the sun and continue to be a place where residents and visitors can read information about the first peoples, the early settlers and the farmers of the district. To move it from a location where it was always designed to be at huge cost undermines the decision of the previous council that commissioned it, the architect Dennis Ward who designed it, and the many people who use it. Also, the suggestion that the fire spotted cabin be removed is definitely beyond the remit of the council and is a matter for the CFA and the local brigades and so should not be part of this document or part of this discussion. So I endorse the amended recommendation for this concept and shall leave it to the next council and the community to proceed with the next stages in formalising a master plan for the site, which I'm sure will contain some of the aspirational features contained in this concept, as well as offering the local and wider community of Millibic and beyond a net community benefit. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rashman. Uh, I didn't want to cut you off. I knew you were on your last few words. Councillor Clark. Sorry, I, you didn't hear me. I'm sorry. I, I was saying I'm happy to have other speakers against. I'll reserve my right to speak. Any other councillors wish to speak? Councillor Perkins. Um, I'm not going to speak against. I'm going to speak in favour of the motion. I, I think um, Councillor um, Ashton has, has uh, grabbed this out of the jaws of defeat. Um, and it's it, it may not be a bad... Um, concept going going forward with the changes that Councillor Ashton has, has proposed. Um, you know, she's absolutely right. There shouldn't be any reference to the removal of spy, uh, uh, the fire spotter cabin. You know, that's a matter of the state government for the CFA. Um, you know, their operational needs, their, their budget constraints, what, what, whatever decisions um, surround that uh, is, a, is a matter for them and, and Council will just facilitate uh, their needs. If, if You know, even if that, that needs to be, you know, perhaps a, a higher fire spot or cabin or, or you know whatever they might might want we should be there to, to um facilitate uh that the viewing options improving the viewing options and retaining the mural uh, viewing platform um i think again 
uh, by doing that, council's dodging dodging a bullet. Um, I think what we should be trying to do, and I think as part of this, uh, you know, work going forward, we're almost going to need some some mediation uh, to get uh, you know the stakeholder groups and, and community on board um, with this plan and and all this concept. And if if indeed changes have to be made to this concept, um, that can happen in the future. But you know, this this perhaps is a a firm foundation. Uh, you know, we don't want to disenfranchise any community groups, um, you know, particularly the ones that, that have, have worked for many, many years and, and are well known to Councillor Ashton, um, you know, to, to support this area and, and, and to run services. Certainly, if, if there are some uh, want a greater involvement, um, you know, we should be trying to facilitate that and try, trying to bring um, all parties together. So, you know, I think there is some, some hope that uh, we, some good can come of this. Um, until Councillor Ashton's uh, proposed changes, I certainly wasn't going to support uh, the motion because I thought it was just set, setting up, uh, you know, really, they should be the same interest, but, but unfortunately, I don't think everyone's on the same page um, quite yet. And I think the most contentious issues have been removed. You know, personally, there are parts of the plan I, I, I don't really um, like that much. You know, the Belvedere, you know, from what's presented, it's, it's a fancy word for a, a carport with a view. I think the, the mural plat viewing platform, um, you know, is a better uh, uh, option than than uh, than new a new Belvedere. But you know, I'll I'll I'll, I'll take on board what what stakeholders and community um, come up with. You know, in working together. But um, again, I just want to reinforce that where this plan has to go is is really trying to get stakeholders together, trying to get agreement. Um, as, as best as we can uh, with the stakeholders before going out to the community, because unless these stakeholders um, can present a, a united front, uh, it'll never get community support and, and unlikely get council support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Perkins. Councillor Brooker. Uh, uh, thank you. Yes, look, I think I've, look, I'm, I support the motion as well that, um, that, that Councillor um, Ashton is, is putting forward. I do think it's, um, it, it's somewhat ironic that, you know, they started, you know, a plan, you know, I don't know if this is the nature of council or, or government more broadly, but they seem to be that their stakeholders, you know, had a far more modest um, ambitions for the site than what has, uh, was presented in the concept plan. And I, and I think that's not to say that we, we should dismiss the concept plan, and, and indeed we haven't. What I think we've gained from a fresh set of eyes looking at it is a fresh set of perspectives of what it could be that we had never previously considered. And for that, I think the, you know, the, the work that has gone into this point is, is to be commended because certainly um, there's a number of elements of, of, of the concept that I don't think we, you know, as council had ever anticipated and even, you know, the stakeholders, but, you know, it's, we, we're going out with the concept to get community feedback. I think that is then maybe, you know, I, I, I've been keen on workshops <laughs> um, in, in a previous kind of context. And I think this is what really needs to happen here, probably along the lines of what Councillor Perkins said. We really need to, um, you know, find common ground. And um, that's not going to happen if people stand their ground. So, we really need to uh, come up with something that is that that looks to the aspirational nature of what is proposed, and that everyone can possibly support something a little bit bigger and a little bit better than than what they imagined. That's that's as I see the future. But it's a you know it flags a massive investment um, for it to be realised. You know it's it's a start. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Booker, Councillor Demir. I'd just like to commend Councillor Ashton on her uh, work in this area. Um, I think this is where councillors uh, are very important, fine-grained understanding of the community, recognition of the work done by the Friends of uh, the Kangaroo Ground Tower um, and the, their ongoing commitment to it. Um, and I think as a, a, a group, they. They're there year in, year out and prepared to put the work in. So, uh, uh, and I think, you know, Councillor Ashton, 
getting in, meeting with people, having a, a really good look at it and understanding the local uh, lay of the land has, has done a great job on this. So support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Jumeric. Councillor Clark. Yeah, I just want to pick up, uh, I'm sure we've all received a letter from the Eltham District of Historical Society, yet we still seem to, some seem to be making the same errors. This is not the Kangaroo Ground Memorial Tower. It's not the Kangaroo Ground Memorial Park. It's the Shire of Eltham War Memorial in the Shire of Eltham uh, Memorial Park. That's its historical name. It so happens to be now located in Kangaroo Ground. And it may well be over the journey that in conjunction with uh, RSL groups and other community groups, we seek to change history by changing the names. But until we do that, we need to reflect upon what this was. Um, in the area that this memorial tower was built, so was the centre of um, administration of the Shire, of the then Shire of Eltham, um, which is why is the Shire of Eltham Memorial Park. Um, and, you know, many over the journey have, have changed the intent of all of this for their own purposes. You know, we have now got a mural uh, platform. That wasn't the intention in the Shire of Eltham Memorial Park. Having a viewing tower on the top for the CFA was not the intention of the uh, War Memorial. Um, now, you know, I would encourage the CFA uh, with newer technologies to look at a better outcome for the Fire Wardens Tower. We need to have, as Councillor Ashton has picked up, the continuity of access for the purposes of spotting fires, and it's still being used in a manual format and has technology in it, albeit the CFA has advised us that a lot of it's very out of date. And we have got, I think, a letter through that stakeholder reference group from the CFA indicating they at some point would probably like to relocate or do something else with it. But there is no need for us to talk about it in this master plan document. It is a matter for the CFA. So I commend Councillor Ashton for removing it. It's got no relevance to it. Um, can I also just uh, again, acknowledge the work of Councillor Ashton in this. this. Again, this site's been sitting around for a long time and needing resolution of a proper master plan. And she's fought for four years to get to where we've got to tonight to get a better entrance point into this memorial park and to the tower, to get better parking and facilities for those that wish to visit. And she's been able to realise that particular vision. I personally don't think the design of the mural platform is a great design. I think there are better spots for it um, in the Shire. Uh, it is a Belvedere of its own nature. Um, and there are, are groups who have tried to take over its use from its purposes of the Shire Park and from the War Memorial Tower, who are now trying to create it for another use. Um, so again, you know, in, in the meantime, in this master plan, there's no take, no good need to take on that fight. And I recognise that with what Councillor Ashton's doing. So I'm supportive of the resolution. I look forward to the final master plan and the council being able to adopt something and get something happen and built and done and fixed. Thank you, Councillor Clark. And it needs to be visionary. Well done, Councillor Ashton. I'd also like to extend my congratulations to Councillor Ashton for the years she's put on over sorting out all of these issues. Um, and I'd just like to say one thing too, I don't think there is as much antagonism and um, disruption, I suppose, between the various stakeholders, groups, you know, the RSL, the, the friends of groups. A lot of it's been uh, manufactured by political uh, people at the moment, electioneering, which is really, really sad. And uh, luckily now the committees are on to that and they've sent around some emails of apologies to, I know myself and Councillor Ashton and a few of the other stakeholder groups and they won't be blindsided again. So that was a good result. We will now put it to the vote. Um, all those in favour of Councillor Ashton's motion. And that is unanimous. Thank you, everybody. Our next motion is 175, Gazettal of Amendment VC 176. Can I have a mover for the motion, please? Councillor Clark, over to you. Mayor, I move the resolution in accordance with the papers. It's a statutory process and uh, um, one which we need to adopt. Thank you. And can I have a seconder for the motion, please? 
Councillor Perkins, over to you, Councillor Clark. Just to say this equally is a, a matter that we've advocated for to try and improve the outcome of planning outcomes so people don't abuse the 10, what's known as the, colloquially known as the 1030 rule under the planning scheme. Um, I think these changes could go further, so I don't want to overstate what it does. It's helpful and it is reflecting the advocacy which we have undertaken. So um, it's a positive step forward as in direct response to the advocacy to try and maintain tree canopy throughout our shire. Uh, having said that, um, I, I don't think residents broadly are going to say, well, that's enough. Um, they're going to want to pursue this much further. But uh, as a starting point, it's a good start. Um, I do think there needs to be further work by the MAV, et cetera, uh, to continue to encourage government to go further, particularly in, in the urban areas. This is not something which should impact on our rural areas. Um, they need where they are bushfire prone in those areas uh, to be able to act appropriately. And this is risk deal dealing with urban areas, um, but a good start, so I commend the resolution. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Councillor Perkins. You don't wish to speak? They don't need encouragement. No, it's all right. I no, just... I think Councillor Clark has, has summed it up well, and it's good to, um, you know, his dying days, give him a, you know, full reign to say what he wants without any interruption from me. So well done, Councillor Clark. Right. Well, thank you, Councillor Perkins. Any other councillors wish to speak? If not, we'll put it to the vote. All those in favour? Sorry, that is carried. I took my finger off the button. Thank you, councillors. Our next item is the annual report 2019-2020. Can I have a mover for the motion, please? Councillor Brooker. Over to you, Councillor Brooker. Yes, can we have the motion up? Ah, okay. It notes the annual report 1920. Uh, notes the annual report has been submitted to the Minister for Local Government. It is presented to Council within one month of providing the annual report to the Minister of Local Government, satisfying Section 134.2a of the Local Government Act 1989 and Section 22.1 of the Local Government Planning and Reporting Regulations 2014. And can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Ashton, back to you, Councillor Booker. Okay, the, the, the annual report uh, comes out around this, this, uh, this time each year. Uh, it's a comprehensive statement um, of the council uh, activities over the past year. It, it's, uh, it seems to get better every year. And um, I think the, the, the use of the case studies has uh, been mentioned as a kind of good example of, of how all that works. Um, it flags the Nilimbic News, which is still our main communication point um, every quarter, which I still have not received my latest one, incidentally. Um, but there's a whole uh, lot of metrics in there, the, a lot of budget material is in there. It's hard to really pick out one or, or two specific things. But if you go through all the strategies and policies we've adopted, they're all listed. Um, the attendance of councillors at meetings is listed. And I think, I don't know if this has ever happened anywhere. I, I would like to know if there's ever been 100% attendance in a, in a year by any council anywhere, but there was in Nilimbic this year. There was no councillor missed a single meeting. So it just seems to me that's, uh, a, you know, a pretty good that's effort. Councillor Brooker. Sorry? Shows our commitment. Yes. So, um, yeah, I think that's, I truly think that's, that's um, really excellent from, from everyone. Um, it lists a whole lot of, you know, committees and, and external committees that we've all been part of over the journey. Uh, so it's all, it, it's a really comprehensive statement. I don't want to talk too much, but it's, if, you, if you're thinking out there of uh, running for council, have a look at this report because nothing is better than giving you a good insight into the activities of the council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brooker. Councillor Ashton? Yeah, look, um, I think uh, Councillor Brooker has covered a lot of what I'm going to say. What I would like to say to people is that the uh, the, the um, report that's online, which I hope is the one that the public have been to see, is, is amazing. It may not be the one that was in the papers, but... Uh, um, 
113 pages, beautifully designed, great photographs, great case studies. Um, and as Councillor Brooker says, I think anyone that's got an interest in local government, or anyone out there, and we know we have a lot of teachers in Olympic, um, it's a it's a really interesting document. It really captures what local government's about. And um, it's like our yearbook, I suppose, and the communities, all the groups that we've worked with. So um, no, really, really great document. And the, uh, the team that put that together, I just want to congratulate them. It's not an easy task. And um, um, so uh, great annual report. If I've, I've used to work in the printing industry and annual reports usually are the most boring documents ever. So uh, I'm really pleased that we've done something a bit different. So, yep, great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ashton. Any other councillors wish to speak? Councillor Clark. Briefly, um, unfortunately, this is not a report which is going to be read by every resident. What a shame. Um, but there is a goal to be won out of this report. This is going to be have to be an achievement which will be a first for Nilambic. And that is, for those that watch these reports, last year we were runner-up in the annual Report of the Year Award. Now, even better, Jeremy's worked on the report this year and with some additional coaching from our audit committee and others that read these things uh, very, very closely. Our attempt here is to win the annual Report of the Year Award and I, I think they've got every chance of doing so. It's an excellent document and I'll be very disappointed if they don't attain that accolade. Um, only left for us then is to be named the best shire in Victoria, but that can't be far behind. So I commend the resolution. Thank you, Councillor Clark. I'd like to um, extend my congratulations to Jeremy as well. Uh, if nobody else wishes to speak, we'll put it to the vote. All those in favour? And that is carried. Thank you, Councillors. Next item is 17720, the Laughing Waters Arts Program. And we've got a mover, Councillor Clark, over to you. Mayor, um, I've got to say, this is probably not the highest profile project, but probably one of those that gives me the greatest pleasure to move in my time on this council. Um, this is a project that everybody said we would never get up. When we started, uh, the previous council had walked away from the Artists in Residency program um, and it was defunct. Uh, the state wouldn't fund it uh, by way of the buildings. And so we just, I'd just been elected mayor and I got a letter in from the then minister, Lily Ambrosio, to say, no, we're not interested. Um, good luck, but don't talk to me again about it. Um, and this has been a nearly four year journey to be able to reinstate, to be able to get a lease back to these couple of buildings, most notably the Boomerang Building and, and the, uh, uh, the Riverbend Building, uh, both Alistair Knox important buildings for us to be able to lease them. Excuse me, could you be the recommendation? Sorry, Peter. You haven't got a seconder or a time. Uh, sorry. Oh, I wasn't worried about either. No, you haven't actually. <laughs> I was too busy listening to him talking. Um, and I tuned out. Councillor Ashton might second. Councillor Ashton, I think you're going to second this motion. Is that correct? And can we have the timer up, please, Blather? Oh, five minutes. You better like get off in thirty seconds. Um, so I'll look, cut you off at four minutes. Oh no, don't don't do that. Um, so I just wanted to be able to say, you know, we, we have, uh, and and I think it was actually Councillor Ashton who introduced uh, the likely. Uh, group um, whose name just escapes me, uh, the Artists in Residency uh, Project, people who are going to take on residency projects, uh, Eugene Howard and his team, have been really phenomenal in working with us to get this up. And I think it was Councillor Ashton who was instrumental as part of that. I think he was a member of the Artists Committee, uh, the Res Arts Committee earlier on. He was. Um, he's been working with us to get funding agreements out of Creative Victoria. So at the end of the day, having Lily Ambrosio told us the state wasn't interested, we we're able to, with Creative, um, with residency project support, be able to get government support. So this will be a project that comes to fruition as a result of state government support um, and the council support, and in just deed, frankly, persistence. 
Um, it is a really important project, this artisan residency project at, uh, at this particular site. It has generated some very important art at projects over the journey. I am hopeful that as through uh, the next iteration, it will also link with Wurundjeri, who uh, with Councillor Ashton and I visited the site and saw it as an important move forward. Uh, I'd want to thank um, Minister Wynne for his support in the rezone. Um, that was a major difficulty. Unfortunately, the zone of the land, public parks and recreation didn't permit us to go back in unbelievably to continue the program. And the two buildings were basically sitting there rotting away. You know, two important buildings in, in the Shire. I, I would argue that they're almost worth heritage listing. Uh, but look, Dick Wynne did, uh, to his word, uh, support this rezoning. He used a 20 part four amendment to assist us quickly. Parks Victoria have now got on board and caused uh, resolutions via, via flying minutes of their board to assist in getting this done. So what the first two years took a long, long time to see is getting a foothold and a start. Government agencies have now come on board and it frankly has just been the persistence of, I guess, myself and Councillor Ashton and, and the Mayor, who equally is engaged in the arts with support of residency projects. I think there has been um, some concern about funding from some other councillors, but I'm hopeful that they will support this. I'm, I feel confident that uh, uh, Councillor Jumerick will, will support the arts in this particular work. Particularly, I was talking to others from the Mud Brick Association earlier on today about the potential restoration of the Ford building, the other Elston Ox building. Um, and so th this will be an important project going forward. So it's a very exciting opportunity that we finally get to tonight to be able to agree the documents with various levels of government, agree the documents, residency projects, and hopefully we'll see, uh, I probably, well, I won't be on the council when they put the first art, artist in, um, but I'm very excited to watch it as a local resident and see this program grow. And I'd encourage the council to look at doing similar things. I know Councillor Perkins has looked at this in doing the a, a artist in residency in Diamond Creek. So I, I would encourage them to continue with that sort of vision it's a great opportunity and I commend the resolution and thank the, uh, the staff for their work behind the scenes to make this happen and the CEO who's been very supportive as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Councillor Ashton. Yeah, I, look, I always think it was ironic that when we have the new citizens, citizen, uh, citizenship ceremony, we'd hand out the book on Laughing Waters, which gave the history of Laughing Waters and the artist residency program um, and it was closed, and um, and it was only when I read that book um, that I realised how significant this program had been. And um, I think with the arts, it's about giving people space, it's about giving them a foundation, and it's about giving them somewhere where they can be creative. And that is what Laughing Waters did to a lot of people over, I think it was about eight to ten years. Um, you know, we have to be careful, you know, the program won't operate during bushfire season. Um, but, we, we, you know, we've got the eel traps down there. It, it, it's a very significant site. In the recent um, Yarra River plan, it's one of the few sites in Nilambic that's actually, actually listed. So it's a very, very significant area. And therefore, I think we do owe, owe it to, you know, Susie Ford and the Alistair Knox and whoever um, used to... Um, you know, have custodianship of that site that we, we as a council value it. Um, and look, one day it will get heritage listed. Um, and uh, residency projects, they've got an international calibre, they um, attract international artists, um, they're well linked in with uh, philanthropic organisations. Um, they will teach us a thing or two too about the arts, you know, just because we're the arts and culture capital or we think we are, I don't think we're we know everything we don't. And I think these are young people with really dynamic ideas. And um, I must say, without Councillor Clark, um, this would have been almost impossible for myself or the Mayor to have uh, worked through because it is very complex. Um, you know, when, you're, when, you're, when you've lost a tenancy somewhere and you go back in after a certain amount of time, it's not obvious where to go or how, how to do it. So I think getting the C125 was a major step. It wasn't easy. So uh, thank you very much, Councillor Clark, for that. And um, I for future councils um, and councillors, 
I, I think uh, we will look back and, and be really grateful that this was the council that saved our artist residency program at Laughing Waters. So, yeah, well done to everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Ashton. Any other councillors wish to speak? If not, I'll just... Councillor Brooker. Thank you. Look, I, I, I think the what's been mentioned already is, is what I would support as well. I think the, the fact that these Alistair Knox buildings are down there by the river is certainly, to me, is, you know, if there's anything unique about the Shire of Nilimbik, it's probably embodied in those, in those buildings um, in terms of, you know, the mud brick, the location. So it's a, if you're going to have an artist in residency project, program, I think that is, that is the correct location to have one um, for those reasons. Um, and with the, the Gordon Ford type involvement, which I think residency projects have flagged, they're trying to uh, resurrect that landscape architecture around the, the Burrung, the, I'm not sure the Riverbend or the Burrung, the Riverbend building, I think, um, would be something to look forward to. I would say just the conditions with the license agreement uh, or the service agreement, I should say, with residency projects goes to A to L. I would like to hear back annually um, for residency projects as to um, you know what the program's about as I think councillors need to know what is you know happening down there and what programs are being conducted so I think you know that's um, not specifically listed in the service agreement from A to L but I think they can easily be incorporated into it thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brooker. I'm sure that the uh, next chair of the Arts and Culture Group will be able to take some of those considerations into account. And speaking as a current chair of that group, I'd just like to say this is really the icing on the, the cake for everything that Jane and I and the various committees have done there, um, starting with the increase in funding to the Nilambic Prize and the, the new prizes we've done with made a major improvement in the arts in the Shire and I'd just like to congratulate all those on the committee for that. But back to the substantive matter on the table, we need to put it to the vote, so all those in favour. And that is carried. Thank you, councillors. Our next item is 17820, the Diamond Valley Library Refurbishments Works. Can I have a mover for the motion, Councillor Brooker? Can we have the motion okay. up the table, please? Thank you. On the screen, I mean. Okay. Uh, that council includes the maintenance, work, the maintenance works in this project and not compromise the library upgrade outcome, approves an additional 324,000 to be allocated to this project and referred to the mid-year budget review for funding. Thank you, Councillor Booker. Can I have a seconder for the motion, please? Councillor Clark, back to you, Councillor Booker. Thank you, Mayor. Look, it's in the, the officer report that accompanies the recommendation. Um, there was a, when this was originally scoped, it was an $850,000 project. Um, once uh, the architects commenced, they found the celestial ceiling um, that goes out into the uh, courtyard had to be replaced and that the southern glass wall windows, which is part of that connection as well, had to be upgraded as well. So it, pay, it, it seemed to be the sensible thing to combine those things together because they would have had to have been done at any rate. So hence we've got the larger um, budget allocation required. It is, I think, you know, uh, this is one of those collaborations between the state government, ourselves, and in this case, Yarra Valley Regional Libraries who have contributed and I want to acknowledge them, um, $50,000 to the project over two financial years, and also an additional $50,000 um, for, yeah, for 2021 to, um, to accommodate the shortfall in funding. So there's a, a number of players here that have um, cooperated to, to, to get a better outcome for Diamond Valley Library. As we know it, well, maybe people don't know, but it hasn't had a substantial upgrade. It's had, it's had regular maintenance. I can't um, decry that. It's that the building is, is, 
in good shape. It's not a, um, you wouldn't say it's necessarily par excellence, but that's where it's moving to. Uh, that's really where it's moving to with the extension of the children's area. We've got DDA compliant toilets. We've got tech area for delivery of steam, all those things, a community meeting room, kitchen facilities. There's a community group meeting there now. I was once a member of the toy library for uh, parents to go and borrow toys. It's a very extensive uh, selection or stock that they have there. Um, part of the redevelopment is a cafe, which is going to be uh, staffed by uh, employees from Araluan, uh, which is a training opportunity for them and uh, a lovely fit for the council. Um, I want, want to say as well, um, part of just the upgrade of Diamond Valley Library per se, once we've got this incredible new building is that we're extending the operating hours. So now it will be op op opening from 9 a.m. every day. So people who are doing school drop off won't have to wait till 10 o'clock. They can go straight into the library uh, and uh, pursue whatever activity they have. I think ultimately what you want here is this to be, you know, to live, you know, for the council to really leverage this um, space in other areas. I was at a meeting this week where the Jane Cowell, the CEO from Yarra Valley attended, and we were talking about, um, you know, opportunities at the Diamond Valley Sports and Fitness Centre just down the road and how they have reading sessions for mothers and babies. And that would be once the centre is reopened, and once everything is reopened, it would be a great opportunity to walk, you know, to have a um, information introduction session for those uh, mothers and infants down at the gym facility and see what, um, you know, fitness type facilities are available down there. So there's a number of kind of synergies that I think that, that are going to be working into the future. But the underlying it all is that is that you've got this library space that's upgraded, that is appealing to young and um, older uh, residents at both ends of the scale uh, to learn, to educate themselves. And there's some activities where they can, uh, uh, um, some spaces if they're small businesses could maybe go there, um, do, do some online Zoom meetings we've become used to. There's an, you know, it's just a really wonderful community focused activity that we really are very fortunate to have in Diamond Valley. And it's just one of those lovely things to support. I'm sorry, Councillor Regan, is that? I, I wasn't trying to be. I wasn't trying to be humorous. But as, um, as the one of the board members of the Yarra Plenty Regional Library, you Yarra Plenty. What am I calling it? Yarra Valley. Yes, but it's the Diamond. It's, it's called Library. Diamond um, Valley Library, but it's the Yarra Plenty Regional Library Service. So thank you for that and correction. Get quite upset if you continue mispronouncing. Uh, I don't know if she'd be that upset personally, but um, thank you. That's all. Thank you, Councillor Brooker. Uh, Councillor Clark. My work is done. I was wondering whether I'd be able to convince Councillor Brooker that libraries are a good idea. I'm now comfortable for him to take over my spot should he be re-elected. Uh, it sounds like he's an advocate now. Um, I couldn't have, uh, I would have simply said what he said. Libraries are a great space. All councillors should participate on that library committee. 70% of our community use them. I commend the work of the Yarra Plenty Library Service and I encourage the next council to look at a standalone facility in Diamond Creek as a very, very, very high priority. Um, showing my age, I was there at the opening of this building when I was on last at Heidelberg uh, Regional Library as then was, uh, when we opened the Diamond Valley branch um, and now I'm pleased to see uh, that one of my last tasks will be to vote for its major major renovation. Um, and I look forward to turning up at its opening and, and seeing it. It'll be a major plus for this local community. And uh, I thank the library as well who are contributing to this that they didn't have to do. It'll be a great uh, project with the support of the state and uh, well done, Councillor Brooke. Continue that on and that advocacy for libraries and uh, you'll do better. Thank you. I mean, I, I, I've never had a bad word to say about libraries. I mean, I'm a big user of libraries, Councillor Clark. 
No, but I would just say, can I just say, and I know my time's out, but click and collect is available from this Thursday. Um, so the library is reopening for click and collect. And the reason I know that is because I'm a, a big user of the library service. It starts on the... Councillors wish to get a word in. It's not... It's on the 28th and uh, we're very excited that we're extending our hours too. So the board's done a good job. I don't know who were the two delegates. But Councillor that's... Perkins. Can everybody mute themselves except Councillor Perkins? Thank you. Yeah, look, um, happy to support, uh, you know, the motion. Um, you know, it's just the process that I'm not comfortable with and it, it, it sort of happens before and I'm sort of, you know, where we, we sort of, we, we've got a project, we've got X amount of money um, put aside um, or found and then it's like, oh, well, you know, we're going to expand the scope a little bit and, and we've got to find some more money at some point in the future and it'll go to mid-year review and we don't know where the money's coming from. Um, it's just I'd, I'd rather see what the, the scope is from the start um you know and uh and work on that and and uh it, it sort of happened with the health and leisure center um councillors you know you're all you're all here that you know the health and leisure center um process um was well advanced when this council got in um but to get it across the line uh on the last council there was no contingency put in so you know we had a report come up once once work works were well advanced it's like oh we need more money um i'd rather see a project scoped fully in terms of you know what officers really want to do and uh you know put that before us and uh and, and not come back with um you know another another chunk here here or there because i honestly don't know where we're going to find the the three hundred twenty four thousand dollars um you know might not be here but uh it's a substantial amount of money um it's a good project i would just rather rather this this been included in the the original scope of works um is my only my only comment but i'll support the recommendation any other councillors wish to speak before I correct Councillor Perkins? If not, I'll correct Councillor Perkins. It was in the original scope, Councillor Perkins. It's just that it wasn't till they actually started to actually demolish the building and get up there that they discovered all these faults and they wouldn't have discovered them until they started the works. Um, the works were going to have to be done as a separate case, whether we renovated or not. No, it wasn't in the original scope, and the and the report bears that out in the summary. Whilst not within the original scope, it is so recommended these works it, should be incorporated. Unforeseen is perhaps it was out, out of scope. Yes. So nice, nice attempt work. to correct me, but you didn't really do it no. terribly well. But anyway, I didn't know it was going to be needed to be done. So <laughs> yeah, put crazy these... not to combine. Can we put Sorry, it? Councillor Clark. I'm just voting. Um, and that is carried. Thank you. Councillors, our next item is information meetings of councillors' records. Can I have a mover for the motion? Councillor Perkins. Yeah. As per the papers, Councillor Perkins, can you mute yourself, Councillor Brooker? Can I have a seconder for the motion, please? Councillor Clark, back to you, Councillor Perkins. Um, I just know the Assembly of Councillors, indeed, um, Councillor Brooker, um, nobody's missed a meeting, but um, perhaps without the pandemic, I might have missed one. I might have been in Bali, but anyway, I missed out. Uh, but Assembly of Councillors, um, everyone's been really busy and, and happy to move the motion. Thank you, Councillor Perkins, Councillor Clark. Any councillors wish to speak? If not, we'll put it to the vote. All those in favour? And that is carried. Our next item is 18020, the hardship request. Can I have a mover for the motion, Councillor Clark? A seconder for the motion, or oh, it's coming up on the page. And can I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Perkins. Uh, Councillor Clark, do you wish to speak to it? Only just an explanation, I think, for all 11 attendees outside of ourselves, uh, just to say that um, councillors don't talk about hardship matters because they relate to personals or individual entities. Um, and that's why it's being dealt with in confidential matters. But suffice to say, this is a uh, exceptionally difficult circumstance we're dealing with um, as a result of COVID-19. Thank you, Councillor Clark. All those in favour? And that is carried. Thank you. Councillors, our final uh, 
meeting her final report rather is 181.20, the tender report contract 1920 for 72 for the solar farm, which I'm really excited about getting up on our final night. Can I have a mover for the motion, please? Councillor Ashton. We got a seconder. Seconder, please. Councillor Booker, Councillor Ashton. Well, um, congratulations to all of us and to the executive management team, I think, and to our environment and sustainability group. Um, you know, this was uh, suggested probably very early on in the term of this council. We had the two landfill sites and we, we decided that um, rather than a leaping into a climate change emergency, we would do a lot of business as usual and we would also uh, investigate um, reducing council's carbon emissions by um, developing a local solar farm. And um, I think in some instances our stars align. We've got the right site. There's a lot of people in the market. Um, we have an incredible team and also consultants involved in this, which means we will get an excellent outcome, not just for council, but for the community. I think this is where this council works at its best and I'm very proud of everything. And uh, we will discuss the tender in confidential, um, but I think, uh, I think the community has been kept pretty much up to date with what we're doing as far as we can. And I think people are getting pretty excited about this. And there's not many councils that are pursuing this um, at the moment. And um, I'm very proud that we're one of them. So thank you. Yep. Well said, Councillor Ashton, Councillor Brooker. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, look, I, I support the motion. I do think um, it's, it's intriguing uh, 2020. Um, the conversation about climate and climate um, emergency was just dominating the news space um, at the end of 2019 and in the first few months of 2020. Um, and it's been completely crowded out by this um, pandemic that we are all dealing with. But I think the point is um, there's various calls for various levels of government to declare a climate emergency. What I would say um, we have done is taken action, taken specific measures, no less, rather than kind of pat ourselves on the back and say, we've declared a climate emergency, now what? You know, what I think the approach we've done is say, okay, we, we have a potential site that could be used for a solar farm in plenty. How do we actually, you know, pursue that and it's been a, you know, it's been quite a lengthy process to identify uh, solar, you know, to, that means excluding some other alternatives like wind, to identify plenty, which means excluding kang kangaroo ground of where the best connection could be. Um, because what we wanted to do is uh, be focused on actions that do two things, that lower costs and lower emissions. And the, and the Plenty Solar Farm uh, has the potential to do both for council. So, you know, we're in this virtuous circle, uh, which is the place to be as this energy transition, uh, I think, gathers steam over this decade. Um, and it's, it's, it's gratifying to think that there is some, you know, some that we have been able to prioritise it to the degree where we are now, you know, talking about letting a tender uh, for Nillenberg's first solar farm, which will, as I say, do do what we need to do urgently and rapidly, and that is lower emissions. So um, it really gives Nillenberg the opportunity to declare carbon neutrality by 2024 uh, with the large scale generation certificates. Uh, it's, it's something uh, I think, you know, we should all be um, pleased about. But, you know, the first step is a early contractor involvement. If nothing goes wrong in the planning permit process, 
um, that will then uh, go to a to the formal tender type process. But it is to say, I think that the community, um, what involvement they have is what we're going to have to figure out um, into the future. What we do know is that the capacity of the solar farm meets Millenbeek's uh, electricity generation okay. quantity. Thank you. Any other councillors wish to speak? Councillor Clark. And you don't have to use your whole three minutes, you know. No. Um, look, in brief, I just want to touch again on the climate emergency concept. I had sent to me, uh, I think it was earlier this week, last week, uh, from those that want to talk about climate emergency, a survey to fill in uh, about what my views would have been about climate emergency. Will I sign up? What will I do coming up to this particular election? And I, I read right through those documents and what they wanted you to sign up to. I've got to say, if there are radicals out there trying to deal with climate urgency, you should have a look at the 60s because you've become conservative. Um, there was nothing radical in the plan. We were ahead on every criteria. We could have signed up for climate emergency twice over um, because if you went through the list, we'd done every one of them and we were ahead on every one of them. Um, so, you know, yes, there is a climate emergency for the world, no doubt about that. Um, but indeed, are we doing our bit? Absolutely. So what I say to that is those that are critics of those that don't do get it right, then now is your chance to recognise when people get it wrong and congratulate them. There's a seminar to be held by Mr Johnson, who's going to be the moderator of that in a few days' time. Sorry, now Councillor Clark, are you sure we want to get the people who get it wrong and congratulate them? No, sorry, the, the people who get it right. Did I say it around the wrong way? I think so. Anyway, so those that get it right, like this council is doing, they should be congratulated and they should be put up there as ways to do it for other local governments. We're not the first either. So, you know, let's you know, pat ourselves on the back, but weekly we're not the first. There are others who have gone down this particular path and we've learned from them as well. Um, but, you know, it is an opportunity for those that are critics of the council on environmental issues to be able to say, gee, they got this right. Now, it's fair to say that they haven't seen the detail yet and they won't see it until we pass our confidential resolutions later on. Um, I would just point out that this is a, an engineer procure, construct and maintain type contract, will be one which we can engage with the community. In concluding, I just want to thank um, our, our staff. Uh, I mean, we're still a long way off. I mean, we're basically just signing contracts, hopefully, and we're starting with a community consultation in October. It won't come online until I think July 2022. But um, as one who, again, at the start, was very keen to see us build solar farms and engage very seriously in this debate, and I remember dragging uh, Yelmar to meetings at seven in the morning and six in the morning all around the town to meet anybody that wanted to talk to us about solar farms or anything with about renewable energy. And he, he put up with my uh, continued harassment about, yes, we can find someone else to talk to. And then made sense of all of that commentary for me and, um, and others and put that into a logical framework and process going forward. We advocated for feasibilities for money to do that. And now we get to tonight. So I just want to say, Yelma, it's been an absolute pleasure over this journey with you. You've done a fantastic job. And if there is ever something you can put your hand up for to say, I've delivered in this community. Thank you. Forward to the 2022 to be able to say that was it. With the support of the CEO, Carl Cowie, well done to the team. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing the opening. Thank you very much, Councillor Clark. And I'm sure we all concur with your sentiments. Yes, good point, Councillor DeMeo. Any other councillors wish to speak? If not, we'll put it to the vote and a very strong all in favour. And that is carried one of the best votes of this council. Sorry, I had my button on mute. Um, we now have some notices of motion. The first one, NOM 00920, Councillor Perkins. Thank you. Well, uh, I'll read it out. Uh, the council requests officers to commence policy and training development in relation to protocols for councillors land use planning in broad accordance with the following uh, City of Casey document titled Protocols for Councillors Land Use Planning and the MOV Land Use Planning in Victoria Council Guide 2016, appropriately amended for the Shire of Nillimbic. Uh, number two, request officers prepare report recommendations for the first 
council meeting of the new council, specifically in relation to the appropriateness of the following section as guidance for all Nilamit councillors in relation to land use, land use planning. Um, and that's their policy of the city of Casey. Um, we talk about in considering any land use planning matters, councillors should, um, when, when, when they receive requests for meetings, correspondence and phone calls, consider where there's merit in, in uh, meeting with the party over and above the consideration of written or presented submissions as part of the decision-making process. Refer meeting requests to the council support officer for coordination, and these will be held in the presence of a senior member of the planning or building department or growth investment department and the director of uh, city planning and infrastructure. Not compromise themselves by having meetings, phone calls or other correspondence with parties without council officers or other parties being present. And where communication does occur, a record of the discussion is required. If this occurs in the absence of a council officer, then a copy of any record uh, of any interaction must be provided to the council support officer to be placed in the file. This is in the interest of transparency and places the active onus on the councillor to maintain the integrity during the course of any planning process. And do not express a view that demonstrates a biased or preconceived view. Uh, that is the motion. Do you have a seconder, Councillor Perkins? Councillor Demerick, Councillor Perkins. All right, so, uh, you know, really what this uh, sets things up is for the, the new council and, uh, and, and just some guidance perhaps for uh, uh, staff, hopefully, to develop a, a policy um, and they can help train, that, that can be a basis for some training uh, to be under, undertaken for the benefit of, uh, of councillors in this area. Um, you know, I was just wondering what, what was around uh, at other councils and, you know, CF Casey, who we know have, have had some issues in recent years, the administrators have brought in this policy and they brought it in, um, in I think it was April of this year. It was only April of this year. It's not, it's not very old, um, but it really does give some good guidance. And I think um, we could do well by looking at that, their policy um, and, and seeing uh, how can we adapt or, or incorporate parts of it. Um, the policy considers um, land use uh, planning matters and, and the council's involvement in, in them. It, it's, there's, there's some subheadings about, you know, requesting advice and information for parties, um, number of dot points there, requests for meetings, correspondence and phone calls. I've um, already, already uh, spoken to that one. Receiving submissions, how do we hear from the community? Decision-making as a planning authority, decision-making as responsible authority um, and the responsibilities. Look, I think it's a, it's, it's a good document. It would certainly need to be amended um, to suit uh, um, Nilabic. There's some other documents around, certainly uh, DMV have, have got a uh, land use planning in Victoria Council Guide 2016. Um, look, I know this, this council when, you know, there's a lot to learn early on, but the, the more resources um, that new councils have uh, to a council, uh, the better. And look, it just, whether it would be incorporated in the good governance um, policy or it'd just be a standalone policy, um, I'm not sure I'll leave that for the officers to, to ponder and, and, uh, and bring a report back to the new council. But look, it, it, it shouldn't be a contentious uh, motion. It's just trying to provide some, some guidance. So everybody's um, singing out of the same hymn book. Um, we all understand, you know, our, our roles of councillors, our, our, our roles in, in uh, decision making in relation to planning matters, um, you know, the appropriateness or otherwise of us meeting with, uh, with, with applicants without um, an officer there, um, you know, we, we as Nilamit Council don't, don't have any policy guidance and, and that's what I'd like to see. Um, it spells it out fairly clearly. And uh, yeah, that, that's, I'd, I'd like to see that uh, introduced for the new council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Perkins, Councillor Demerit. No, any other councillors wish to speak? Councillor Clark, sorry. Councillor Brooker. Actually, um, have, have a, I have a question maybe through the chair um, for Rosa. I don't know if she's still up this late about the MAV Correct. land use planning. Just one, one moment and we'll get her on the line. Won't be a moment. Evening. Um, look, Rosa, I don't know if you, um, item one, the, this is a um, protocols for councillors using the uh, city of Casey and the MAV. Um, and then, 
so I'm, I'm quite comfortable with, with area one. Area two requests officer prepare a report along the lines that are, that are in italics. Is, would, that, is that, would it be sufficient for you to prepare a report just on number one, just on the MAV Land Use Planning Victoria Councillor Guide and the City of Casey? Um, yeah, we could easily prepare a report on those two. Because I, I think that the the rest of the page, you know, there's some things that I you know would agree with. I think the other thing, maybe some things are a little bit too restrictive. But I guess my my question would be um, not not having a phone call without enough another officer, you know, present. I I think. I can see some practical kind of problems there. Um, would that be something that you could maybe share, have a comment on? Um, certainly there are aspects that we will have to um, consider moving forward, whether they're, you're right, whether they are practical and how we, if we do introduce them, how would we then monitor that or from a governance perspective? It may be that, I mean, that, that particular example can be um, modified. It's not mandated um, in any particular provisions or acts or regulations. So it's certainly something that we can work with and modify it to be appropriate for us. Okay, so what, what you're saying is you can come up with a protocol for councillors using the MAV land use planning and the city of Casey planning, but not necessarily following the italics here when you present the report. That's right, yes. Well, it asks for a new report, okay. you know, it Terrific. asks for a report um, in relation to the appropriateness of, of those bits in italics. It's not saying adopt them, it's saying, you know, a report on the appropriateness oh. or otherwise. You wish to speak? Okay, Councillor. yes. Yeah, I've maybe missed that, Councillor Perkins. Thank you. Uh, while you're still there, Rose, I think Councillor Ashton has a question for you. No, I would speak against the amendment. Okay. Councillor Brooker, are you continuing? No other questions. Is there an amendment? Oh, sorry, a recommendation, sorry. Oh, the motion? Yeah. Um, over to you, Councillor Ashton. Look, I, I think that we are definitely not the city of Casey. I think that the rural areas of Nillambic are definitely not anything like the city of Casey. I think I came onto this council when we had planning applications that were all running well over 60 days, particularly in the rural areas. We had people that were had no indication of what cost how many more reports they were going to have to complete. Um, we had the new BMOs come in. Um, over the four years, and I know that you were Chair of Planning, uh, Councillor Perkins, but that you have, um, that you, you know, that your, your, your advice is always just rely on the officers. Um, but, you know, I, I have dealt and I've spoken to over 500 people, so please um, report me now. Um, I've never compromised myself or this council. Um, we all take an oath when we come on council with regard to council conduct. And I believe we've all had the best interest of the community and council at the forefront of our thoughts when meeting with residents. We know that we can't, um, you know, make promises to people, but we can listen. And even when I've known that people aren't necessarily going to get the result that they want, I am available and I'm often the conduit that explains what can be a very, very complicated process, such as when uh, uh, somebody's living on a 10-acre block and another house gets plonked right on their fence line because as far as the BMO is concerned, that's the safest place for the, the property to be situated. So it's very complex out here. We deal with land management plans. We deal with Section 173s. Um, you know, it, it, uh, we deal with land capability surveys where I go out and see somebody where an officer has suggested that they can't put a septic in because they have a ephemeral waterway that may appear once every 10 years. So I'm sorry, um, I email people, I contact people. I don't think I've ever made one mistake since I've been on council. Um, well, I'm human, I have, sorry, but um, I don't think there's one resident out there who would ever say that Councillor Ashton had misled them or had uh, put the council up for ridicule or even given bad advice. All I've done is listen. And I think as in some recent cases, when we do listen, we can advocate, even if we know that a, plan, a planning application will be successful, we can try and um, make sure conditions are as 
suitable as possible for those people that object and we can try for the best possible planning outcome. And um, we're not Casey, I don't want to be Casey. And we all have very unique wards and we all know the planning issues that we face in our wards. And RCZ planning is really um, a, a law unto its own. We have really, oh, we've got North Warrandyte, we've got Bender Vales, we've got Hobby Farms, we've got everything out here. So if I had to ring council, I would need a dedicated planner to work with me and they would probably be, uh, I'm saving council thousands of dollars because um, I'm going out there talking to people and it means that it, of course I get advice from planners before I go out on, on things, but it's not something I need to do and it would take up too much of my time if there was a third party involved, so no. Thank you, Councillor Ashton. Any other councillors wish to speak? Councillor Clark. Can you answer, yes. Councillor Clark? Perhaps start the clock again, Blaga. Sorry, what I was just saying was when I read this resolution, I thought, here we go again. Councillor Perkins and Danielle Green trying to create more grief. We've just had a rewrite of the Local Government Act. It's just been passed. Did the government say anything about these matters? Did they try and codify the way in which we deal with planning? Did they make any comment whatsoever? Answer, no. Danielle Green didn't raise it in the parliament. Councillor Perkins didn't suggest it on his board position at the MAV that we should consider it. Silent, deathly silence. Um, you know, I see this resolution following pathetic commentary by Danielle Green in the parliament. If we need a code of conduct, it's a code of conduct about use of parliamentary privilege. Councillor Perkins um, at the last meeting sought to try and ask a bunch of questions to be to be trying to be smart about uh, meetings that I had with two residents about the Bannons Lane application. It fell flat because the residents appreciated the contact, realised that we we're simply seeking to understand the circumstances from their perspective. And that's what residents want. They want to talk to councillors and understand uh, and, and be able to put to them issues concerning planning. We are not a growth council. Casey is different. A, it's alleged they were corrupt. That's different from a start, despite Daniel Green's false and defamatory allegations in the parliament. Um, if you are changing zoning of land, which Casey does, so you're taking land that might be worth $2 a square metre, making it $10 to go from rural to industrial or rural to residential, a whole different ball game. Mind you, you only need to act legally and not corruptly, and you can work fine. Um, we never deal with those sort of rezonings. So it's not even applicable, even if you wanted to argue that the government should do something, which they have not done. So I say to Councillor Perkins, and I say to, to Danielle Green, whose pathetic attempts to besmirch people's reputations Last week, she called the officers acting of malfeasance in the parliament, attacking our officers on matters. This week, she called them corrupt, including me. Love to see her say it out in the public arena. We should not. As someone said in the parliament this week, and I, I asked them whether I can use the quote, because it's really appropriate. If brains were taxed, you would get a refund, Councillor Perkins and Danielle Green. That's all I've got to say. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Any other councillors wish to speak? If not, we'll put it to the vote. All those in favour? Sorry, right of reply, Councillor Perkins. I can Thank you. After that, I reckon I deserve one. I can um, it, yeah, really? Have we hit a sore point? I think we might have. Um, yeah. You know, Councillor Ashton, you know, it's, real conservation zone planning is not a law until its own. Um, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, obviously you would never describe these principles, you know, where I was when I first joined, joined council and, and, and it was reaffirmed um, for every year until this council started. You don't meet with applicants, you know, you, you avoid meeting with applicants, you know, if you do, you meet, you meet with, with the council officer there. Um, I don't, I don't think it's a, it, it's a, 
it's a bad process. It's 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 what generally happens until uh, you know this council. You're, you're you're followed the lead from Councillor Clark, and you've ended up in a in a in a spot, perhaps where you know otherwise you mightn't have. But um, you are where you are. You know, Councillor Clark. Well, you know, in terms of uh, you're 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 not going to be with us for much longer, so it's not going to be as much of an issue. Um, you know, if if that's how developments are done in the city of Melbourne, and that's what you're used to. Uh, well, good luck to you. But, uh, you know, certainly um, Nillenbeek and, and the planning scheme, there are some, it, it's got nothing to do with the city of Casey. It's just a good policy document. You know, forget about the city of Casey. Um, it, it just, you know, lays down some principles that, that councillors should abide by um, when dealing with planning matters. You know, we're not planning experts. You know, we, we are, we are, we are councillors. We're community advocates. Um, we can try to um, point people in the right direction. But we shouldn't be there trying to negotiate with applicants in terms of what's an appropriate outcome or or, or what uh, what what restrictions may or may not be placed on a on a on a planning permit. Um, this is what I've seen uh, some in this council do, and it shocked me to be honest. But you know, you think that's normal? That's okay. Um, I'm just saying it's not. It's not the way that um, planning matters are usually dealt with. Um, it, it's been uh, a a very different four years on this council in terms of planning, and uh, you know. Regardless of the outcome of this vote, I'm sure officers will, will try to uh, provide some guidance for a new council. Any other councillors wish to speak? Can't. Fight, write a reply. It's got to go to the vote. Oh, write a reply. I'm losing the plot. I was too busy listening. Um, I'd just like to ask uh, governance a question, please, um, Blago, as to the uh, clarifying what Council Perkins has said about uh, councillors meeting with residents. Mm -hmm. Currently, this council doesn't have applicants. a with applicants. So this council doesn't have a uh, an adopted policy on protocols around um, land use planning, um, as stipulated in the uh, the motion. There is um, guidance material from state government and and other bodies and councils that have adopted certain protocols. But it's up to this council how to, um, whether they wish to adopt a, a protocol in the future. And what about um, meeting with residents in general with, you know, issues that they have, whatever they are, whether they're planning, whether their cat's lost, whatever it is? Um, so if we just pertain the question to, to planning, um, there is one element in terms of the Good Governance Guide that talks about planning conferences and meeting um, with officers present um, and applicants and that. So there is one element in relation to that. Um, I mean, for practicality reasons, um, uh, answering phone calls and things like that isn't, I, I don't think that's um, inappropriate, but documenting conversations probably would be. Um, again, practicality in relation to that would be difficult if you could receive numerous phone calls and you know, alike, but if it becomes a, an issue, um, probably best to raise it through the offices and, and, and obtain a, um, an, a formal meeting of some sort. All right, thank you. Uh, any other councillors? No, we're still back at your right reply. We need to put it to the vote. All those in favour of Councillor Perkins' motion. All those against. And again, I'll use my uh, clause 45 to use my casting vote, and that is not carried. Hang on. Which way did you vote? Against your no norm. Oh, surprise me. Um, division. All those in favour of Councillor Perkins' notices of motion, Councillor Perkins, Councillor Jamerick, Councillor Brooker, all those against, Councillor Egan, Councillor Clark, Councillor Ashton, and I've used my casting vote. Our next norm is over to you, Councillor Clark. Norm 01020. Mayor, I move that Council amends the Council expenses policy by deleting 5.1, the mineral vehicle. And you'll be asking for a second. I'm, I'm going to second this for the reason that Councillor Booker has used before, and that is to have the debate. Can I just get some governance advice and, and ensure that the chair is allowed to second the motion? Of course she is. No, you're not the governance advisor, thankfully. I'm happy to take Blaga's advice on that as well. Just put on my mic. It'd be more accurate than Councillor Clark's. I think what the uh, the good governance principles call for is is the the chair to to vacate the chair. 
Oh. Advice or delivering it advice, Councillor Perkins. If you're going to ask for it, get the answer. Don't tell them what the answer's got to be. Took the words out of my mouth. Where's Rankin? Probably enjoying life. <laughs> Sorry, just wanted to confirm um, that, yes, it's, it's correct. The chairperson ordinarily wouldn't be involved in moving or seconding a motion or in a debate. Um, so preferably it would be outside of um, the chairperson moving or seconding the motion. All right, well, I'm happy to take your advice. In that case, it's up to you, Councillor. Can I clarify that? You're saying it excludes the mayor seconding a motion? So the chairperson, um, his role is to monitor or to, to maintain the meeting and not to move and second a motion. What clause is that? Um, well, I'm happy to go with governance advice, so I'll have to open it to the floor for you to have a so second. Just, Councillor uh, Blugger? I, I will, sorry, just to confirm with uh, Councillor Clark through the chair, 37, clause 37 does indicate that if the chairperson wishes to move or second a motion, they would temporarily vacate the chair. The chair, and I can't because you're the deputy. No. You're muted, Councillor Councillor Perkins. Another person could chair the meeting. That's my point. You can move or second a motion. Somebody simply has to vacate the chair. That's all. But, but who? Well, we can elect it. That's the point. It can be done. But it's not like go, we go to the deputy mayor. Can you, you, can, you can obfuscate all you like. The rules provide that the mayor can move or second it so long as they step aside as the chair. Or if you're having so much trouble getting a seconder, how can you even hope to win, win a, a, a vote? We're not having the debate now. I will hand it back to you, Councillor Clark, for, and I'm not going to vacate the chair. You need another seconder. I'm sorry. Otherwise, it lapses. In that case, I'm sorry, Councillor Clark, your motion has failed. I'm sorry. Our next notice of motion is NOM 1120, Councillor Clark. I move the, move the resolution. Thank you. You keep um, muting yourself, Councillor Clark. Probably good news. Did Did you want to read it or I don't think people it was on up long enough for people to to see it. Let me read it for the purposes of the community. And that is that uh, council amends councillor expenses policy by inclusion of the new clause under section five resources, meals and beverages at council meetings and briefings. Council will meet the cost of the provision of meals for councillors at council's expense for all on-site briefings, committee and ordinary council meetings. Two, council will make the cost of the provision of beverages of tea, coffee and non-alcoholic beverages at all meetings where meals are served. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Can I have a seconder for the motion, please? Councillor Ashton, back to you, Councillor Clark. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ashton. Um, Mayor, this issue seeks to do in the first instance, do what is the current protocol, that is, <coughs> When we have a council meeting, briefing or committee meeting, the council is provided with a meal. Given that we arrive um, generally, certainly before five o'clock, um, we then go through various briefings or meetings. We adjourn then for a meal because as is indicated tonight, we actually started at five o'clock. We stopped for a half an hour, albeit we had a meeting meal at home. And now we're still going at quarter past 10. So rather than uh, finding that councillors were losing concentration or whatever else as a consequence of not having a meal, um, the council understandably provides a meal. That's fairly straightforward, but is not listed in our council policy as the protocol of what we do. The second point um, seeks to deal with the matter of beverages at meetings, and that it's almost by omission, but specifically excludes alcoholic beverages served at meetings uh, where meals are served, that is, meetings that are council meetings, briefings, or committee meetings. And that broadly is in line with any other business or workplace, um, and certainly the circumstances that pertain to offices. So, offices, when we would ordinarily meet in person, 
wouldn't partake in alcoholic beverages because they want to provide sound advice, not impacted um, by alcohol, but they have access to the same range of beverages elsewhere. It's a protocol often developed in most other councils. It seeks to overcome the problem that is most notably probably at the city of Melbourne, where uh, you know the, the open bar scenario there certainly caused grief both at council meetings and thereafter, uh, pertaining to the Lord Mayor's then resignation. Um, and so this basically you would have thought is a fairly straightforward resolution, sets in train the circumstance so that the next council doesn't have to go through some of the debates that we've had. This should not be a bigger issue. It should be a workplace health and safety issue, uh, just of an obvious status. Uh, doesn't purport to uh, uh, point the finger at, at anything other than creating a safe workplace for all to ensure for anybody that's having matters, whether they be planning or any other matters considered, um, being done so in an environment um, which uh, pers everybody's, uh, I guess, got their best foot, for foot forward to be able to make those determinations. Um, so I commend the resolution. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Councillor Ashton. Um, I don't think, um, you know, with regard to uh, uh, sexual assault, I don't think we can blame that on alcohol. And I, I think that should be, you know, it's not necessarily a, a, a case in point. However, I do think that um, potentially um, when we're making decisions, um, it's uh, probably good that we don't have alcohol at meetings and I think that what was acceptable um, you know 20, 30, 40 years ago when the uh, CEO had the key to the drinks cabinet and people would have a, a sherry beforehand and a gin and tonic afterwards I think those days are changing and I think that um, potentially I, I, I agree that uh, beverages should be limited to tea and coffee um, However, I'm sure that there will be opportunities when we have gallery openings and other festivities for people to enjoy the wonderful wines and things of Nilambic, but um, I agree that I'll support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ashton. Any other councillors wish to speak? Councillor Brooker. Yeah, look, I'll be supporting the motion as well, but it's a, it's a rather curious way of going about it because it, specifically doesn't mention alcohol. Um, it specifically mentions provision of non-alcoholic beverages. So look, I'll, I'll support the motion. I, I do think, you know, my whole point about this issue, um, when Councillor Clark brought a similar motion, I can't remember how many months ago, which I think seems, seemed to me, my recollection is ban alcohol at all council functions, which I didn't support um, for the reasons that Councillor Ashton just said. But I think really it's um, this, this policy, I think I'll support, but it needs to be maybe tightened up because there's at the moment, there's, it's possible that, uh, you know, councillors could bring their own alcohol. Um, it's just that council won't be providing it. So, and I, and I wouldn't support that. I don't, I don't think there should be any alcohol at um, briefings, meetings um, or anywhere. That, that we're considering matters of importance, matters, you know, that are, uh, of, you know, that we're serving our public, when we are serving our public purpose. Uh, so I'll, I'll support this and a new council may have a, have a look at um, maybe having to alter it depending on, on the, how it's implemented. I suppose I'll, I'll describe it like that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brooker. Any other councillors wish to speak? Councillor Demerick. I think it's odd that um, councillors are uh, voting on what the next council will do at the last minute of their last meeting. It's sort of like uh, we'll shut the door and turn off the lights and this is what you're going to do. I think, as I've said before, I think this... Uh, policy should be taken up by the next council. They'll come to a, a an agreed arrangement on how they're going to work together. And, you know, it's, I think it's a really bad look to be shutting the uh, door and uh, changing policy, you know, at, what have we got, 
20 minutes to run in the last meeting of, the, of our term. So, you know, if Councillor Clark's favourite, I don't know why you didn't bring it up the first meeting. Thank you, Councillor Jamerick. Uh, any other councillors wish to speak? If not, right of reply. I presume you're voting against it, Councillor Jamerick. Right of reply. Thank you, Mayor. Um, look, just to say, this isn't the 11th hour trying to get something through. Uh, I don't think anybody could accuse me of not raising this on... No, I'm sorry, you're right. It's one second to midnight. It's not the 11th hour. It's which to midnight? One. Anyway, uh, the, the point being, this is not the first time I've raised the matter. Equally, it's not the first time I raised uh, trying to save the council a dollar in not running Merrill cars. It seems like those that are running seem to be desperately keen to be able to get a free vehicle out of the job. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I think this, you know, I take Councillor Brooker's point, you know, I could have worded this in 55 different ways. I tried to do that at the last council meeting or a couple of council meetings back when we were talking about the councillor expense policy where it formally came before us. But Councillor Perkins, in an effort not to debate the matter, tried to shut down the debate, just as he did tonight on the relationship or, or the conversation about um, the mayoral car. Because there are some conversations some councillors just don't want to have. Because I don't know why, but the nature of getting something free seems to be exciting to them. A free car. I, I don't know why people like Councillor Perkins and some others don't go, you know what? We're a councillor, we're pretty important. I should have a councillor car. We could have seven councillor cars. Um, the exercise is the community gets us there to make some decisions. It's not a matter of what we can take out of it. And, and so this is a very small matter in that respect. Equally, it's important by way of the quality of the outcomes that we do achieve. So yeah, it's a small legacy that one leaves. And yes, the next councillor can change it. I suspect they won't because we'll have finally dealt with it to a policy, as Councillor Ashton rightly points out, to a policy that occurred 20 years ago. In the 80s, when I was on the then Heidelberg Council, they went through bottles of scotch and everything else like you wouldn't believe. You know, there was a big party almost after every council meeting. It was appalling and it should never have been allowed to occur, but it was the attitude of the day. Oh, we're here, we can, we can do what we want. Well, we shouldn't do that anymore and we should pass this resolution. Thank you, Councillor Clark. All those in favour of the notice of motion? All those against? And that is carried. Our next notice. Division, sorry, Mayor. All those in favour? Councillor Eaton, Councillor Clark, Councillor Brooker, Councillor Ashton. All those against? Councillor Perkins, Councillor Jamari. Our next notice of motion is 013, Councillor Brooker. Yeah, through the chair, um, what I would like to do is separate A, B and Sorry. C. No, through, the, through the chair, oh. um, Councillor Egan, we've missed um, notice of motion, 1220. Oh. The library. Sorry, Councillor Booker, back to you, Councillor Clark. It's because it's been printed on the opposite page. I'm not used to looking on the other side. Under uh, time. 12.20, over to you, Councillor Clark. Time check as well. Understandably, Councillor uh, Egan. Uh, look, this resolution is that Council resolved to cease work on the proposed redesign of the Eltham Library Gallery space and not revisit these design options. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Um, and can I have a seconder? Briefly, and then I'll just, Councillor Jermaine, can I, is it all right, Governance, if I just interrupt the meeting now to vote for an increase in time, please, Councillors? Can yeah, I have a procedural a, motion? Procedural motion, although, uh, can I have a mover? Move an extension. Thank you, Councillor Brooker. Second to Councillor Clark. All those in favour? And that is carried. Back to you, uh, Councillor Clark. So, Mayor, this has not come forward as a report to the council because we had a briefing on this particular matter uh, following a series of work that had been done by stakeholders uh, involved in this. I, I was able to participate in one meeting uh, with stakeholders. 
I've got to say the vast majority of the stakeholders that were participating in this particular process um, were consistently commenting to many that they were not supportive of the direction of this project. I well understand its intent, which was to try and improve uh, the capacity for display of art within the gallery space at the library. But as we are well aware, this space has often been called the library's living or lounge room. And it's more related to the library entry foyer and space than it is as a regional gallery. Um, the dilemma of what was being contemplated would have uh, made the ramp network difficult to so it would have provided up a whole bunch of barriers and I think would have been to the detriment of the quality of the architecture of the important building, which is the Eltham Library. Equally, it did not have the support of the library or the librarian. Um, and so, you know, I'm sure there'll be some in the arts community that say, look, this could have been a positive for us. Um, I, for one, believe that's not the case. I certainly don't want to spend another dollar on this. I, I respect the intent officers were traveling down with this, but the outcome is not worth uh, progressing. So I also want to make it pretty clear that we're not looking to just shelve this for a while and we'll come back to it. What it does do is highlight the um, urgent need of a gallery space of reasonable proportions, whether that becomes um, an adjunct to the community centre, which a number have suggested, and I think that's got substantial merit. Um, but we certainly need a, a more substantial gallery space to be able to run proper exhibitions and indeed display uh, the art um, that the Shire uh, holds. So I commend the resolution. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Councillor Demiri. Uh, I agree with Councillor Clark on, on this. It's a, the library's a, a fantastic Greg Burgess uh, design. Uh, it was designed with the intent of the foyer area being like a community lounge room and uh, to be used as such. So, you know, it can be used as a, a gallery space, but uh, can be converted into any number of other um, other uses. It is the uh, foyer to the library uh, and as such a community space for all ages. And it's the, um, I suppose the active area of the library. Libraries as, as a rule uh, to be quiet spaces. Um, this is sort of where uh, you can sort of do the more active part of, of library library life and, and community life. So uh, I, I wouldn't like to see it changed uh, and definitely not to white walls and uh, the sort of thing that uh, needed to display art, uh, I suppose, really effectively. Uh, and in recognising that, I think uh, there is a, a need for gallery space throughout the Shire. And I think that's something that needs to be looked at. I, I know that uh, there have been steps forward in the arts uh, for through this council uh, with, uh, what well, we've just seen, the Laughing Waters with some uh, improvements in, in the Nilimbic Prize, uh, but uh, you know, gallery space is still uh, something that uh, you know, the community is looking for. And that's at all levels, you know, from uh, the beginners right through to uh, our art prizes. So, uh, you know, I, uh, I don't support the gallery taking over the, the front of the library. Sorry, a gallery taking over the front of the library, but you know, I do support a gallery. So uh, for that reason, I'll be supporting this motion uh, and uh, hoping that uh, in next the next council plan does something about addressing the, uh, the lack in, in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Demerick. Any other councillors wish to speak? If not, I'll put it to the vote. All those in favour? And that is carried. Thank you. So now, Councillor Brooker, um, it's over to you. The next notice of motion 013. Can we have it up on the screen, please? Oh, thank you. Well, yeah, thank you, Mayor. I would just ask the um, to use your discretion here. What I would like to do is have three notices of motion and separate A, B and C into three different motions. So councillors that may support one motion but not the other will be able to do so. I'm happy to do that, Councillor Booker. Thank you. Through the chair, just to confirm, it's one notice of motion, but each part will be voted on separately. Yes. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll just um, read out the first one as we're doing uh, all three. Um, council amends the councillor expenses policy at section 4.4 and 6 um, as follows. A, under the heading conferences and seminars at section 4.4, add words approval by the CEO to the second paragraph. And the, what I'm referring to is the, the council yeah, the council expenses policy. So 4.4, we add the words approval by the CEO to the second paragraph. Do you have a second to Councillor Booker? Councillor Perkins, back to you, Councillor Booker. Thank you. The CEO needs to be put back into the council policy. Councillors are limited in how much uh, can be spent in attending conferences and seminars, um, being 20% of their annual allowance. And I do think, and <laughs> there is a long sorry history of politicians um, from all parties at all levels of government um, have caused all number of problems for themselves when they've been able to approve their own expenses. Um, we don't have to look too far to have examples. Just, I think, two years ago, there was the example from the previous uh, member for Eltham, Steve Herbert, who came in to some trouble for having, using, a, I think, a, a state government-provided car to ferry dogs, Patch and Ted, in fact, to his holiday house in the country. And those sort of incidents happen because Steve Herbert never had to run that activity by anyone else. He could just do it. So I think what we really need to do as regards attending our own conference, it's perfectly proper that we have a conversation with the CEO and explain the reasons we wish to attend a conference and how it relates to our portfolios or how the uh, residents of Nilambic can benefit from our attendance. And I do think knowing, you know, the current CEO, he would kind of in that um, brogue um, of his look <laughs> at you and say something like, of course, Councillor Brooker, you can do um, whatever you think would serve the interests of the Shire of Nulembic, but I think that might be most unwise. And I think that is really the kind of relationship that there needs to be, that the CEO is able to say, um, you know, this is not really, you know, pursuing the objectives of the council plan or whatever it happens to be. So we need to put the CEO, CEO I'm sorry, back in the space of, of this whole area. Why? Um, because, we've said, as I've said, I could use many other examples from the other side of politics um, as well and whether it's um, people taking helicopter rides to attend party-related um, conferences. There are many examples of where, when you don't have to account to anybody, you make bad judgments. And that's what we need to avoid. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brooker. Uh, Councillor Perkins. Mayor, can um, at a point of order of just process, Yes. I thought we were going to run one debate and then, then vote on each part separately. We're going to run three debates here on every of these points, are we? I mean, this should have been three resolutions if that's what he wanted to do. I'm happy to vote on the bit separately, but not run three debates. We'll, we'll be still here at midnight debating dot point C. You don't want 15 minutes of Brooker. Lava, can you clarify, please? Through the chair, um, that is correct. So right. we move the motion as it is, um, and there's one debate. And then when it comes to voting, um, Councillor Egan or Mayor Egan, as a chairperson, we can separate. You can separate the um, points into three points for voting. So to help the timekeeper, Councillor Brooker had two minutes twenty left to deal with the rest of his resolutions. So back to you, Councillor Brooker. Thank you. I'll, I'll take the two twenty. Uh, look, the second resolution. Um, I won't read it out, that's got my time. Councillors are required to complete the assessment requirements of the AICD course. Uh, the, the kicker here is councillors that enrol in the AICD course and fail to submit all three parts of the assessment will refund Nillimbit Council the $7,929 course fee. Well, sorry, I've included this Council amendment. Could, sorry? Can the councillors mute their things because I'm getting the feedback again. Uh, okay. 
Could we do that? Thank you. Um, yes, I've included this amendment because I think greater scrutiny should be applied to councillors choosing to enrol in this course, mostly because it is a very it is very expensive training. The course lasts for one week of classroom type learning. Three councillors in our term have enrolled in it. When you investigate what is provided, you learn of the assessment requirements to graduate, and I've listed them. It is a su substantial time commitment, and the actual threshold thresholds for passing is 65%. So hoping to just get it half right will not be enough. I'm happy to say uh, my graduation certificate I did receive in the mail. Um, however, a couple of councillors, uh, one of which is no longer with us, um, did enrol in the course and did not do the course or complete the course assessment. Point the learning order, from the course is order. actually crystallised when order. you have to apply it in point of order. Councillor Brooker, one moment. Councillor Clark. Councillor Brooker seeks to besmirch the reputation. <laughs> what, can you let me finish, Councillor Brooker? Besmirch the reputation oh. of uh, a councillor who is retired from this place. Can is there any factual evidence other than Councillor Brooker's allegation of the outcome of the AICD course entered into by all councillors? And if so, do we want to table all councillors that did it and what how it concluded rather than trying to besmirch the reputation? I'm, I'm not trying. Not a view well, of allegation of Councillor Brooker. Well, yeah. if I can speak to that, um, Councillor Rankin it's told me he didn't do the assessment. Brooker. My question is not of Councillor Brooker. My question is of the administration, either the CEO or manager of governance. Blaga? So I don't, um, I don't have any record of um, the completion of the certificates or anything like that, so I can't comment, unfortunately. Thank you. Does the CEO have any records of the allegation that Councillor Brooker makes? Uh, no, I don't. Then I think Councillor Brooker should withdraw the allegation unless he has written proof. Well, <laughs> Councillor Rankin said he never completed the assessment. I've never That's, heard him say right. that. I've never heard him say that, so I think you should withdraw oh. the allegation unless no. you prove it. I don't. Not and he's not all. a councillor anymore. He's a, he's a he's a resident of Mornington. Thank you, Councillor Brooker. Um, can, can please oh. continue, but without referring to Councillor Rankin. Okay. Um, I, I mean, it, it, it wasn't a, <laughs> a question of besmirching anyone. Um, just laying out the facts. Look, the. The learning is in the course is crystallised when you do the assessment. What I'm saying is if councillors are going to spend that amount of residents' money on a training course, they need to, at a minimum, submit the assessment to demonstrate good faith, faith with the residents. I emphasise they don't need to graduate from the course, but they do need to submit the assessment to sh demonstrate that they have taken it seriously and not just um, spent a week um, having morning and afternoon tea. Um, as regards the, the third item, item uh, end of councillor service, replace written down value. The market value is determined by reference to some online auction sites. This is in relation to mobile phones and um, PCs like I'm looking at right now. Um, this, is, this is the typical um, method that is used when Councillor car, um, uh, council cars, for instance, are disposed of. And it's just an asset of the council that needs to be written down to what an auction site would sell that product for. That has happened to me in the term of this council when my computer was upgraded. Um, it was the written down, not the written down value, it was the market value of that uh, piece of IT equipment that... Um, I was able to purchase perfectly, I think, sensible for everybody for that the, an online site to be referenced as the value of that asset, and I paid that amount of money. Thank you. You can <coughs> over to you, Councillor Perkins. Oh, thank you. Um, look, specifically with um, uh, dot point A, I can certainly um, speak in support of that. Um, been around a little while, and, and in the past. Uh, uh, 
the administration, yeah, with the support of the uh, or the oversee of the CEO, always did all the bookings for flights and, and for accommodation. Um, I know uh, for my own self, when I was mayor in well, 2013, whatever it was, um, I travelled to Canberra, you know, stayed at the cheapest accommodation I could find. Well, I didn't find it actually, the staff found it for me, but it was, it was very moderate, you know, um, wasn't expensive. Um, you know, we've, we've got what's happened in these four years is we've got, uh, you know, uh, now the ex-mayor uh, certainly likes to stay at the, uh, the Canberra Hyatt when he goes to, uh, to, to Canberra. You know, five-star accommodation. That's why you need actually uh, the CEO or staff um, overseeing uh, the expenses of, of, of councillors. If there's no uh, guidance in, in the, the policy, you'll have, um, you know, councillors who, who want to stay at five-star accommodation yeah. for conferences yeah. and se seminars. Um, it's, it's totally inappropriate. It should be. Councillor Clark, point of order. The point of order is Councillor Brooker's resolution is seeking to put the CEO to seek approval for to be able to attend conferences and seminars. Yes, nothing to do with hotel prices. Nothing to do with expenses of going of travel, of where you stay, or anything else. So my point of order is Councillor Brooks, Councillor Perkins is not speaking to the resolution. Correct. Seconded the council. Well, that's not correct, actually. I'll read, I'll read from the policy. Councillors must obtain approval from the Chief Executive Officer for costs involved with their attendance at conferences and seminars held in Victoria or interstate. We're talking to the motion on the table. Yeah, and he's trying to put, put back in the... Uh, the uh, the CEO approved by the CEO. There are different resolutions in the, the second paragraph. There are councils must obtain a formal approval. There are different um, sections in the council of policy about travel and accommodation. This doesn't deal with that matter. This is about getting permission from the CEO to actually attend, whether it's in a tent or wherever. Well, perhaps we can ask Blaga what what. Maybe I'm looking at the wrong doc document, but it says councillors must obtain approval from the CEO for costs involved with their attendance at conferences and seminars held in Victoria or, or in the state. Are we talking about something different? Uh, so through the chair, um, the costs associated with attend attending conferences and seminars, that's in relation to the cost of the seminar or the conference. The travel cost is costed into a different category um, and that's the way I, I can confirm through the uh, finance the chief financial officer but that's how I um, understand um, for us to be uh, taking down the costs associated with travel and um, expenses of that nature are, are possibly in a different um, area of the policy. Thank you Blaga. So the motion on the table. Well I'd like to know where, where, whereabouts is accommodation covered because I, I was assumed that that's why the CEO has oversight of, uh, you know, costs involved with their attendance at conferences. The attendance involves... Councillor um, Perkins, it's not the motion accommodation. on the table. Can you please get back to the motion well, on the table, which is to uh, add words, approval by the CEO to the second paragraph. It's to, as to whether either the person's used their allocation of funds or they've been 10 to 10 conferences. It's not about where they're staying. It's in a No, it is. It is about where they're staying. It's about whether they want to stay in two-star accommodation or, in your case, five-star accommodation. I've made my decision. Either keep your... You can't stay at the Hyatt. ...to the motion at hand or move on. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't be staying at the Hyatt. Did you stop that's, arguing? Well, that's the, that's the point. It's I a debate. What you think. It's not what we're debating. Well... It is. I said it six weeks ago, but it's you've gotten already. I've got it in front of me. Councillor Perkins, you've got the whole thing in front of you. Go to, the to the motion on the table. You've got three. You're fast running out of time. You've got one minute and 52 seconds left. You've got still two more points to talk to. Councillors must obtain approval from the CEO for costs involved with their attendance at conference and seminars held in Victoria or in a state. Um, I can see there is a, there is a, a, a separate section for... Um, uh, travel, travel expenses, um, but I can't see, you know, accommodation. I, I've, you know, I. You want to comment I, on the other two points? I was on council when 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 this policy first came came to being. It came came to being because there was a certain councillor on the previous council, and had been there for a few councils before then. He used to gobble up the whole budget. You know, he used to use all the money 
um, for the whole budget for the seven councillors. And when somebody else tried to go on, on, on a conference, uh, there was no money left. So we needed we needed the oversight of the CEO to step in and sort of... What happened to the clock? Sorry, we can't have one councillor gobbling up all the money, and you know, and using the, the, the whole bucket of money. You know, we can't have some councillors who, who like to stay in five-star accommodation and, and other councillors can't get to go any, you know, can't, can't get to attend uh, these conferences or events on, on that. Like, it's it's totally appropriate that uh, the CEO knows how much money is being spent. You know, I, I, you know, I don't see the bills. You know, I, I just see the stuff on Facebook with you guys um, at the Hyatt in uh, in Canberra, you know. But, but, you know, it's a CEO that gets the bills. So you need somebody with some oversight to be able to sort of say, well, hang on, this uh, this isn't right. And, uh, and 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 pull you guys up now. Uh, Fifty percent of the problem is going to Melbourne, but you know we, we might still have we might still have an ongoing issue with um, councillors who 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 want to stay in five star accommodation on the public purse. You know, <laughs> my goodness. Of course, this has to be supported. Um, it's a it's a very well this part of the motion anyway, um, Councillor Brooker. Um, it's worthy of support. Uh, you know, uh, the rest of it. Yeah, probably not. But, uh, you know, the first dot point, uh, it, it, it certainly has been an issue. We need somebody, uh, you know, with some oversight, um, the CEO, it's appropriate that, you know, these monies have to be administered. We can't just have, uh, you know, an ongoing situation where we've got Dr Dracula in, in charge of the blood bank. You know, it, these are ratepayers funds. Um, you know, we can't always imagine that, that councillors will do the right thing um, because, I know for one, I've seen some dodgy stuff go on and it, it shouldn't and it shouldn't happen. And it's less likely to happen with the CEO keeping a very, very close eye on councillors who have very, very expensive tastes and come from the, you know, perhaps south of the era. Yes, and they drink a lot too. Thank you, Councillor Perkins. Um, anybody else wish to comment? Councillor Ashton, thank you. I would like to reassure residents that I've been on this council for four years and that um, I'm not aware of anybody on this council abusing anything. I, I think that it's not so much an approval by the CEO, but that in some instances the, the, it's worth getting guidance from the CEO and that councillors, um, you know, we, we get lots of invitations, um, very few pa people sitting here tonight have, have gone and done very much. But I think, you know, for new councillors and for myself particularly, it was good to run by what we were doing with the CEO and I have no problem with that. Um, I, I think you have to be careful though that the poor old CEO doesn't get held liable if you've got a, uh, well, perhaps you should be liable if, if councillors were abusing their privilege, but uh, potentially it's something that governance and the CEO have to look at when councillors want to do things. And um, if it's all above board and it sits within your portfolio in a particular area of interest, then I don't think there's a problem. Uh, with regard to your taste in accommodation, Councillor Perkins, I think that depends on, you know, um, yeah, re reasonable expectations um, as to what, what is relevant and what hours you're gonna be putting in where, wherever it is you're going. Um, but I, again, running it by the CEO, checking out that it's reasonable, I don't think there's a problem with that. Um, I actually agree with Councillor Booker with the second point too. I've done a lot of evening courses and studying my time and I've always finished what I started. doesn't always mean you're going to pass, but it means you have a go at it. Um, so as somebody that's had to pay for a lot of my own education and courses, I think that um, that's, that's something that people have to take seriously. You don't do something without intending to at least attempt to pass. Um, so I agree with that. Um, I'm not sure, and it's probably a, a question to officers, when we talk about the written down value, is that the book value? Is that what we're talking about there? Are we replacing the book value with the market value or is the book value the market value? Perhaps Vince or somebody could answer that for me. Vince on the line? Yes, he is, look, he just magically- Hi Vince. Hi Vince, can you just explain the difference to councillors please? Yes, good evening, councillors, through the chair. So the written down value is the value which is carried in our books. 
Um, so for small items in and around, uh, say anywhere from a thousand dollars to three thousand dollars, they're usually written off within two years, if not uh, earlier. And market value is uh, something attained or which is reasonable for uh, someone out out and about to be able to purchase that item. So that's through uh, say uh, reputable websites. Thank you, Pinks. Uh, oh, sorry, Vince. Does that mean like so when you say somebody so buying the item secondhand at that that year and use of of the item? That is correct, uh, Councillor Ashton. So it would take into account the uh, wear and tear and condition of that item and what uh, the say the public in this case could uh, purchase that item for. Okay. Whereas the book value is there used for taxation, you know, for writing off after lease leasing equipment and correct value. so so let so um so the written down value is often a lot less than the market value am i correct correct thank you thank you councillor ashton any other councillors wish to speak councillor clark thank you mayor um well as much as i had Councillor Brooker, understanding the values of good libraries, he hasn't got 101 on good governance. Um, if hasn't he worked it out already, the circumstances around council expenditure, the review process under the new local government act goes to the audit committee, which is where it should go. Um, it's the audit committee that reviews our expenditures, not the CEO. And there's a reason for that, that the government got it right and Councillor Brookie got it wrong. And that is, we employ the CEO. So the government was clearly concerned that, you know, councillors might say, one week, I'm about to review you, CEO, I'm about to review your remuneration and your KPIs and everything else. And by the way, I'm off to a conference next week. Um, what do you think I should go or not? Um, that puts the CEO in invidious position. And that's why the government said, it's not for the role of the CEO, it's for the role of the audit committee to review councillors' expenses on a quarterly basis. And that's what's gonna happen going forward and what's now included in the act. Um, because it's just totally unfair to put the CEO in that position. The matter of travel and expenses is a different section in the uh, expenses document for those that went through it in detail like I did about six weeks ago and brought a raft of recommendations which were which were agreed to, to bring it up to, to modern standards. Um, that is a different section totally. Um, you know, Councillor Perkins again runs with smear and innuendo about stuff that he's got no idea about, which is typical of the attitude that he takes. It's why, you know, Mr. Herbert gets himself into trouble, why Danielle Green got herself into trouble on red shirts. Uh, the short story is all of my accommodation has been booked by the uh, when I've done a trip and I've done a couple to Canberra to get bring back cash for the show, um, has been booked by the uh, executive assistants to the councillors and the mayor. And it is true on one occasion, I stayed at the Hyatt. You know why that was, Councillor Perkins? Because they had a cheap rate and it was cheaper than the other places that the others were staying at the national conference. It was cheaper than everywhere else. But you wouldn't know about the facts and the truth you run with smear and innuendo, which has been typical of what you've done. For and I'm supposed to believe you. You were better in the first couple of years. You've fallen off dramatically. And I hope that, you know, when you go through an election cycle, either they get rid of you or indeed you wake up to yourself and go back to playing the policy circumstances and not the circumstances that sit around personalities, which is what you've become active in of recent days, trying to run the smear and innuendo. Equally, B and C don't for, worth, aren't worth any further comment. We did this six weeks ago. Uh, if you wanted to do something about saving a dollar, you could have saved it on the metal car, but you wouldn't do that because you want to take the biggest prize you could possibly ever get, rather than what Councillor Regan and I did and use our personal vehicles. Didn't even charge a dollar for travel. Well, with the real world. Well, well that's what we actually have to do. That remains to be seen. Clark, uh, any... Other councillors wish to speak? Councillor Booker, right of reply. I've just got a question. Have I got a right of, right of reply? Yeah, well, just a question, first of all, through through governance. Um, 
Councillor Clark has said that the um, expense, you know, approval for conferences then goes to the audit committee. It's true, isn't it? But by the time it gets to the audit committee, the individual councillor would have attended the conference. That's true, isn't it? It is true, but I'll refer to the yes. Chief Financial Officer as well, just to confirm that. Uh, through the chair, I can confirm that the reporting to the audit committee is once the expense has been incurred. However, there could be provision uh, moving forward uh, if uh, councillors wished to uh, use the audit committee as a point of independent approval. Uh, that could be something to be explored um, through a guideline policy or seeking that point of reference to uh, the audit committee in the future. Yeah, so they could ask the audit committee or they could ask the CEO. That's the point. At the moment, if it goes to the CEO, it's too late for them to do anything about it. Thank you. Or is that a question? Right of reply. Question. Yeah, thank you. Look, the, the right of reply, I think um, the, they're all very solid um, policies to adopt in the council expenses policy um, for the reasons I've said. Um, by the time it gets to the audit committee, it's too late. That's why we need to get approval from the CEO prior to that. Um, in terms of the AICD, I never mentioned any, any individual councillor's name. Councillor Clark jumped in and said, oh, you're meaning this particular person. Um, I do think it's um, really worthwhile that we have to submit the assessment. Um, it's as for, count, for the reasons Councillor Ashton said, as a sign of good faith, that is the minimum requirement for a councillor. Um, as regards the replacement value for the same reason. If, if the council can sell a computer, a phone for what a, a market value, I'm sorry, yeah, for the market value as they can get on a website, that's what we ought to pay. No, no extra favours for councillors. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brooker. We now come to the voting. So we'll vote on the first item, which is regarding the conferences and seminars. So on that, Councillor A, all those in favour? All those against? And that is carried. We now go to Councillor uh, item B which is the one referring to the AICD course. All those in favour? All those against? Good heavens. And that is carried. We now go to number so, seven. I had myself muted, but can we have a division on both of those, please? Yes, certainly. On the first item A, all those in favour? Councillor Brooker, Councillor Ashton, Councillor Demerick and Councillor Perkins, all those against? Councillor Egan, Councillor Clark, item B, all those in favour? Councillor Egan, Councillor Booker, Councillor Ashton, Councillor Demerick, all those against? Councillor Clark, Councillor Perkins. Item C, all those in favour? All those against? And under section 45, I'll use my casting vote. Um, the division, all those in favour? Councillor Brooker, Councillor Ashton, Councillor Jamerick, all those against, Councillor Egan, Councillor Clark, Councillor Perkins. So that is not carried. But how do you use your casting vote? It doesn't just mean you get two votes. You've got to tell us which way your casting vote went. Well, I still went. have my hand up. So okay. I'm against so, last So one. we won. Correct. Yeah, no. That's right. Well, well, the last one, it was defeated. Yes, the last motion was defeated. Thank you, councillors. Six weeks ago, it was in fa it was unanimously in favour. Yeah, well. We had no, excuse me, councillors. Neither of you were chairing. We had no delegates' reports, but. Mayor, for the 30 attendees that are still there, I wish to seek leave to move an urgent item. Uh, Sorry, to governance, do we need to vote on this or is it just up to my... Uh, through the chair, it needs to be a, a motion on the table with moved and seconded. That's um, Yep. All right, would you like to put a motion on the table, Councillor Clark? So that's what I was just doing. I wish to move an urgent item uh, 
which I was titled, if you can put it up, see what I was looking to do, Merge an urgent item in relation to the Andrews Park tennis courts and parkland. <coughs> do you have a second at Councillor Clark? Councillor Ashton, back to you, Councillor Clark. Mayor, I'm moving this resolution. It's an urgent item because, as we're well aware, there was a tender being let and work is about to commence. Um, so without going into the merits of the resolution, which is about the deferral and running and having some com further community consultation, unless we take an action on this particular matter tonight, um, uh, the works will commence and we have no more meetings under this council and we move into caretaker on September the 20th. I did raise this issue uh, having a bunch of, a number of residents raised it with me last week and I've raised it with most councillors. And I contacted councillor Jumeric during the course of last week and suggested to him if he wishes to have a resolution to defer this matter, I was more than happy to second it and pointed out that he'd need to get a resolution in within the next day. Equally to those residents who rang me, I suggested you know, it would be preferable that Councillor Dumeric deal with this matter rather than me from outside of the ward uh, deal with it. You know, obviously we prefer local councillors to do that. We have um, a clock on. This could go for a while. But the matter uh, from Councillor Dumeric, there was no notice of motion. Um, I, I didn't do anything more until I was contacted about midday today by a similar number of residents. I was aware that there's a petition up for over 150 people seeking for us to defer this matter and have some community consultation about how we can get the best possible outcome and do that as quickly as can physically be done so that we don't have any significant delay. So as a consequence, um, I prepared a resolution. I didn't get to circulate it till probably to everybody till about quarter to five um, so that uh, the residents at least could hear the debate. I think as we're well aware, there are you know at least 13 attendees. I suspect most of them are still there waiting to hear what's going to happen with respect to this particular matter. And I would encourage the councillors at the very least to enable the conversation and the debate to occur. So this at the moment is just allow the debate to, to do so. Um, basically, if you do not allow the debate, certainly indicates there is no intention to have any consultation with the community about this matter. And thus far, we've had no consultation with the community. When we actually um, passed the resolution for the tender and indeed um, for the further application for another one point think three or $5 million for other works in Andrew Park, I added with the support of Councillor uh, Jumeric a, a resolution to have community consultation. My concern with this all along has been that there has been totally inadequate community consultation. And that is the view of a number of, I'm not saying it's all, but a number of members of the community uh, who want to engage in the conversation. Um, I'm certainly not trying to stop the work of Eltham Tennis Club getting a couple of tennis courts, albeit this was not our idea. It is in a sense, in a sense an outcome that came as a result of a state election. Um, and as a consequence of that, um, this project's progressing. So. I urge you to allow the motion to be debated and then we can decide how we're going to progress so the community has proper consultation. Um, I find it somewhat ironic for those that um, have accused us for not having proper transparent consultation if, if they did not at least support this resolution. Without today. allowing the motion to be debated, Councillor. Can I just have a question of governance? Yep. Well, that's a yes. Um, Blaga, in terms of uh, allowing this uh, this motion to be put, does it need um, unanimous decision uh, support of council, or is it just a majority? Majority. Uh, over to you, Councillor Ashton. I think we. I'd like to debate this with everybody. I think. Um, it's an interesting one. I don't want to talk too much about it now. I'll be interested to see if uh, the group agrees to allow the motion. I think uh, it was one of those things that probably none of us had been petitioned about having additional tennis courts. We got the money. It's always nice as a council to get funding. Um, um, I think there's a lot of other places where we potentially could have used this better. 
Um, but um, it is what it is. Um, however, um, it does appear that, um, you know, not only, did, uh, I won't say the community is totally against it, but they would like to be conferred. And I think um, discussion with Councillor Jumik has indicated that there, there may be better solutions to the siting and the other use of the parkland. And we do understand it's a valuable space that people do use and it's flat and it, it, it's open, um, which is not is a good thing. You know, we don't always want everything covered in concrete or play equipment. So uh, I, I would I would um, ask that people at least allow um, the recommend uh, the motion to be debated. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ashton. Any other councillors wish to debate the notion of having the debate? If not, we'll put it to the vote. Oh, Councillor Demerick. Um, I'm happy to have the debate, providing uh, councillors are going to not just treat, they're going to treat the residents seriously, because what's going to happen here is we're going to end up going out for public consultation. Sorry, and, Councillor Demerick, this is a just, you can't talk to the motion. I, I, talking to as to whether we should debate it and there's two two things that can happen it's either going to be if we want, if we want to please one group it's going to be don't do it if we're going to continue it's going to continue as of you know monday or tuesday of next week so you know we're uh, just populist um this is just a populist motion it hasn't been considered and uh, it disappoints me greatly. Any other councillors wish to speak? If not, we'll put the motion to the vote to have the debate. All those in favour? All those against? Sorry, Councillor Brooker, you're muted. You can't just start talking when we're in the middle of the vote. So I was putting up my hand to vote. So what we this this is saying we're going to go and then have a debate about so the urgent motion. Okay. Started a minute ago. All those in favour of allowing the urgent item to be accepted. All those against. And that is carried. Now we now go back to the motion on the table, Councillor Clark. You're muted, Councillor Clark. Oh, I only wish. Um, uh, if you could bring up the resolution, um, please, officers. Let's see where I wrote it. So the council immediately defers work at Andrew Park, Eltham regarding the construction of tennis courts until agreement of the preferred layout is achieved. Two, undertake consultation with the Eltham Tennis Club, residents, park users and the Eltham Football Club uh, to consider improvements to the current design of the Eltham Tennis Club expansion. These improvements are with the intention of maximising the usable space of Andrews Park for unstructured re recreational activity. Three, commence discussions and negotiations with the current contractors and the state government to minimise penalties and disruption to the project, ensure that the funding remains available for a plan uh, with Broad's community support. Four, commence public consultation with residents and park users for the next stage of Andrews Park. Proposed development, which would include the three by three basketball court, exercise stations and toilet block. I so move. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Do you have a seconder? It would be somewhat ironic if we got the first one and I couldn't second. Councillor Ashton. Back to you, Councillor Clark. Um, <coughs> Mayor, you know, as I indicated earlier on, I've put this resolution up at the request of a bunch of residents. To be honest, it was not a preferred course of action that I get involved in this. What should have occurred is proper consultation before we got to this particular point. Um, no one wants to stop the tennis courts going in. I've certainly met with the tennis club some time back and, and uh, worked with them and, and was keen to support the upgrades of their current facilities, which, which we've, we've done some of. Um, 
and I understood they wanted to look at these additional courts. The question becomes the nature of um, the uh, park and the occasional unstructured play, which this seeks to override in terms of the current design. Um, we have had forwarded to us by a local resident landscape architect a range of different options about other ways it could play out. And I'm not going to comment on whether or not they all work, one's better than the other. But there does seem to me at least the potential for a better outcome to review some of those, which would enable more structured or uh, unstructured uh, play activity to occur. Equally, I received, just as the meeting started, a letter from Mr. Peter Lamont on behalf of all of the user groups at uh, the Eltham Football Club and the Eltham Cricket Club, who highlighted how they use the, the space for um, warming up and for other uses and how they hadn't been consulted about the use of the park, etc. And they were very, very concerned that this would proceed without any of that consultation. And they, of course, are very are large numbers of members. We're aware of the over 100 uh, people on the petition who are equally concerned about the lack of consultation that has gone on here. Um, and, and so the question is, can we get a better outcome? Um, as I indicated earlier on, this isn't a project which you know, was in our Shire plan or whatever else. It's a result of state government funding. There's a series of, of timeframes to try and achieve the outcome. Clearly it's gonna be constructed through summer months. I've got to say, I, I am a bit surprised in the COVID-19, I thought the rules were that you couldn't start projects in COVID-19. Uh, you could only finish projects you currently had underway. So, you know, um, gardeners can't go and work out in, in uh, the scrub cutting the grass. Uh, you can't do an awful lot of things. I can't get uh, a park planted in, um, in Bridge, in, in uh, John Street. But it seems to me we can let a contract and works can start with bulldozers and everything cutting this up. It does seem to me that we could have at least used the delay nature that sits around COVID-19 to give ourselves some breathing space. Um, without, I would have thought we're currently subject to extensions of time on this project due to the nature of COVID-19 uh, because they could not start. I would find it remarkable in these circumstances if we're starting works in, in this particular environment. I'd, I'd really say to the, um, the members of parliament, they should be talking to the contractor and ensuring that the departments don't commence work and, and cause activity when we're trying to get just a gentle walk along the path uh, for exercise um, in this particular period. The work shouldn't be starting in any event till we get to probably October when we get out of the COVID-19. It seems like the government's got rules to itself for these sort of projects. Um, so that should buy us the but time. Mark, you do realise it's our project. That it's it's the time frames that we're talking about extending, Councillor Jimerick, and you can speak in a moment. No, but you do realise it's our project. You're talking about the government. It's it's a project which we're delivering on behalf of the government. That is true. Um, and equally, we cannot deliver the project on behalf of the government. And it's a matter of saying to the government, look, there's a delay here. We want to get the design right. Uh, we don't want to incur any costs. And we can say to the contractor, look, we shouldn't be starting. It's COVID-19. So let's use this time to do some consultation via Zoom meetings or whatever else. Look at getting the best possible outcome for the community. And in the meantime, when people try to get the least two hours of exercise that they've got until we get to October, that they can walk along the path and do that without a bulldozer running past them. Um, there seems to be, you know, whilst there is, we don't want to have contractual issues, there does seem to be those sort of matters that do need to be sorted out. So I would say to the councillors, um, I would have thought, hoped the councillor Jimrick would have sorted this out rather than the not. I would have hoped we would have had proper community consultation, which is what was been exemplary in my ward, um, that uh, we get on and get this done properly. So, you know, councillor Jimrick, you chuckle, but you throw, you throw rocks in others about proper community consultation. This is the time to get it right. Take the time. Join with the band and let's look after the community. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Councillor Ashton. Thank you. Um, I think it comes back to what I was talking about previously. You know, whatever we do should have a net community benefit. Um, funding is obviously always welcome, particularly in Nelbic, where we, we, we don't have a particularly huge rate base and we are trying to keep the rates down as much as possible. 
Um, so funding is welcome, but not not necessarily really only benefits a small uh, group and not necessarily a, a group of local residents. Um, you know, a tennis club is a tennis club. Um, I, I know that club quite well. Um, it, 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 only, it, it only ever seems to be at capacity two or three times a week. Um, we talk about permeable surfaces and, and retaining water. I just think that um, there, are, there are so many places in Nillambit where this money could have been spent. And I'm thinking particularly of research um, where they, they, we've got flat open space with an old pipe on it and no, no park. Um, and I think it, it, the, the money perhaps could have been spent better elsewhere where we would have had a community benefit and it probably would have been most welcomed by the community. So I've never really been convinced about this project. I think um, we've got an opportunity now just to draw a breath, um, talk to local residents, see if we can get a better outcome. I do understand it's difficult because we've sort of committed to it, but, um, you know, I... I I think um, we need to really make sure that it's not just the tennis club that are going to benefit from this, uh, you know. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ashton. Any other candidates wish to speak? <clears throat> Councillor Perkins. Well, I certainly won't be supporting this motion. What an absolute nonsense, you know. Council defer works at Andrews Park re regarding construction of tennis courts until agreement is achieved. Agreement with who? Um, agreement will never be achieved. You know, there, there are people down there um, who have dug their heels in and, and, and you know, good luck to them. But we can't always uh, get everybody on board. You know, this is, this is a, the right decision in terms of what the decisions that this council has already made. The tender's been let. Um, you know, send the money back to the government. Um, that's where this this will end up. Uh, it's, it's a very, very poor process. For this to be the last decision of council um, to send back $1.3 million uh, to the state government, uh, you know, Council Ashton, you know, bleating now about um, research, uh, didn't get a mention um, in, in terms of the, this, this grant project. You, you know that it, research wasn't eligible. Um, you know, there was an opportunity there. We applied for the grant. It was short time timeframes. And, and, you know, luckily enough, we got $1.3 million that will benefit the broader community, um, you know, via the, the Eltham Tennis Club. Uh, I, I can't believe, you know, the, unfortunately, Councillor Ashton, when, when the poorest decisions have been made on this council, you've been at the centre of it. Um, and it'll be your legacy. This is a disgrace that, um, you know, the numbers are, are going to, uh, to, to do this um, because obviously we've got the Mayor and the Deputy Mayor and now with um, Councillor Ashton, don't you know, anything. Uh, no. the poor, happen. poor, poor governance. Um, yeah, you'll be remembered for this, and, and this is this is a, a very, very poor decision if it goes the way it's looking like it's going to go. Thank you. Any other councillors wish to speak? Councillor Jamerick. Um, I I think uh, Councillor Perkins might have this mixed up with the uh, pocket parks. This is a state government uh, election promise from two years ago. The Eltham Tennis Club has worked on this for 10 years. Um, and it is a park which is uh, fondly regarded by locals. Um, it is a, a relatively unstructured park. It's still very wet in winter, uh, rock hard in summer and um, but as I say, perfect for uh, you know, take your dog down for a run and what have you. Um, when the announcement was uh, made, you know, I uh, had difficulty with it. Uh, it has gone through a number of iterations with this council. Uh, it has been pushed through all the way. It has gone last week, I think it was, or the week before we, um, we put out the tender with works to be started. And uh, this week we've got Councillor Clark flipping uh, and you know, against everything he sort of, uh, he talks about in good governance. And, you know, again, this is poor governance to, to, my, um, to my way of looking at it. We're gonna either, we're gonna do 
one of two things is either we're going to put this off for until we find uh, what was the, what was the wording? Sorry, until uh, we find agreement on an outcome, which we will never do, uh, or we're going to end up having to hand the money back because we will not make the deadlines on this project. Um, you know, I don't think we're going to get any meaningful uh, public consultation out of it. Uh, and I am very doubtful that we will get a better outcome. Uh, so, you know, we'll end up with money being sent back. But uh, you know, good on you, Councillor Clark. Go you know, two minutes to midnight, you're out the door and you're throwing spanners in the work again. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Councillor DeMerrick. Any other councillors wish to speak? Councillor Brooker? I just asked some questions from Yelmar, if he's still with us, about the project. That's good, because I was going to as well. Ah, you, you, do you want to go first? No, you've got the floor. Here he comes, HP. Okay, I think, just I just want to sort out, so we, we everyone is clear, um, and maybe people people listening, we, the, the tennis court project was a growing suburbs fund that was successfully applied for. Is that correct? correct? And correct. that was, and that is what we let the tender for a, a month, a few weeks ago. Correct. And the scale of that, the size of that project was around 700. 1.414 million dollar grant. 1.4, the whole 1.4. Okay. So how does that how is the juxtaposition of that and the Andrews Park Eltham um, funding with the three by three basketball kind of work work out? That's a separate grant that council has resolved to support, which is uh, through the pocket parks grant, local parks program, which is yet to be decided and we're yet to hear the result of. So it's possible with the pocket parks program, we will be unsuccessful at Andrews yeah. Park. We don't have the results yet, so yes, it's possible. That funding is 1.3 million. Okay, so we're possibly looking at an investment of 2.7 million if things go right at Andrews Park and Eltham, if, if both come off, is that correct? So we definitely have 1.4 million for the tennis court expansion. We're yet to hear on the 1.3 million for the uh, local pocket parks. Okay, are the siting considerations for the tennis courts kind of incorporating the fact that we may be successful for the pocket park? No, the tennis court siting came first, pocket parks came second. Okay. There are other factors it, related to siting that relates to the proposed location of the, uh, the tennis courts. Okay. Is there any conflict between the siting of the tennis courts as they're currently construed and potentially Sighting of the pocket park three by three basketball. Not at the moment. No, but if they were to be changed, that that's an issue, isn't it? Potentially, depending. Okay, on the so it's it's difficult then. It seems to me to be having a community consultation process when we're unsure about one element that could be developing in Andrews Park. I guess I don't need you to answer. That, but it seems to me, well, you can't answer that. It seems to me that would be problematic, wouldn't it? I think you've answered that question, Councillor, yes. Okay, the all right. Okay, because um, it seems on the council resolution, it, it, it talked about um, uh, consultation, I think, with with all all parties or something to, or, or other. Um, I think, you know, talking to uh, the CEO earlier, it, it seemed to be suggested we, we could maybe do it do some kind of this is where it's going to be short term kind of one day thing is that do you think possible in this time or we'd be more than happy to explain the rationale for the current location to interested residents okay and we could lay out exactly what what we've done and why we've done it correct okay and I guess I'll ask, I mean, this I guess is always going to be the answer, but you're very 
solid in the rationale for choosing the the sighting that you have? Absolutely. From what I've seen, I'm confident that the location, the, the there's constraints with the site and the location um, meets the criteria around um, best location. Happy to share that in more detail. Right. Okay. So what if they then came to you like Councillor Clark suggesting and say, okay, yeah, but you haven't considered that we used to kick the football here pre-game. And what? how would you respond to that? We'd be happy to hear and discuss and hear other points of view. Absolutely. Yeah, but they could they could possibly kick their football on the tennis court, couldn't they? <laughs> like is it, or they or they both work there on Saturday afternoons with their footy boots on the tennis court. That'll go well. <laughs> you can you can wear runners and then change. You can wear runners and then change. You can share share the space. Legitimate question for Yelmar Grant instead of no. The others I think were legitimate. That wasn't. That's fair enough. Um, I think I. Th You've muted yourself. My dream. I think I think that's all. Thank you. Just whilst you. Yelmo's there, I've got a question too. So if we're just dealing with questions. Yes. Um, can Yelmo, can you just outline to me? I mean, the nature of the contract having been let, just so I do understand uh, my concern about whether or not they can start a new project under COVID nineteen, and whether or not. COVID-19 best practice should be, look, until we get to the point where new things can start, whether or not the contract provides for um, a commencement compliant with the other regulatory relations that everything everybody else is complying with. Yeah, without having the DHHS um, uh, exemptions in front of me, construction uh, projects have a different uh, uh, set of requirements to... Uh, Council Operational Services, so basically five people per site is, is a general rule, and they have a different COVID type plan that's required. And so any construction undertaken on the dry would be in accordance with the HHS construction requirements, which are a touch different to um, operational services, parks and open space. Thank you. Um, my question, Yelma, is about um, damages and the cost of delaying the construction. Even if we were to say delay a week and go out for consultation, what would be the cost, if any? Yeah, with, it's difficult to pinpoint or quantify the exact cost. Um, basically, it would be a delay on council's part to a contract, and that would have to be worked through with the, uh, the contracted party. Most standard contracts that we let have uh, those clauses included. So, is there a risk that the contractor would walk away if we delayed for a week? Or you, that's too hard a question. I, I, I think the risk on the week more relates to the end date that's committed in the grant commitment. Uh, I think you know, sm shorter timeframes are always negotiable. Anything longer, and, and again, without um, having the discussions with a contracted party. It's always difficult, but uh, clearly longer delays give greater reason to um, uh, suggest that we're breaching contract or causing delays. Okay. Um, Councillor Brooker, have you spoken to the motion as yet? Well, we'll go over to you now so you can speak. Yalmar, if you could just not go away in case you've got any more questions, please. Well, it seems to me the 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 issue here of of citing, it's 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 a, a, an issue of citing of there's that's the issue of of, of configuration. Now, you know, I, I I think if we, I don't think I, I don't think we're miraculously going to come up with a perfect solution that suits everyone here. Once you put tennis courts on that spot, um, you're, you're constraining the amount of open space that's left. I don't think there's any getting around from getting, you know, around that. Um, I think it, it's probably appropriate to, to maybe more fully explain the rationale as to why it has to be this way and why an alternative is you know what real advantages come from that? What real 
benefits uh, you know, come to the community for a siting decision. It's not a decision whether we're going to proceed with tennis courts, it seems to me, at, at um, Andrews Park. We've got the funding, the 1.4 council, Ashton would like it, the tennis courts and research, but that's not on the table. What's on the table are tennis courts at Andrews Park and Eltham. And we're arguing about whether they're being sited like that way or that way they're, they're turning up either way. Um, so I think it's really kind of a marginal sort of point of view at the, at, at, at the margins to, that, that I think to me don't justify a delay in the, in, in, in the commencement date that p council would have to pay the penalty for. I mean, there, we, there, the director of infrastructure has said there would there would be a penalty for, for council to do it. Well, we're going to have to come up with that money, and all we're going to do is come up with a citing that look. It, it might be better, but I don't think it's going to be fantastically better. I don't think it's going to be you know brilliantly better that everyone is then going to be saying, "Oh, thank goodness um, we did it that way." Uh, so that's that. I think that's where I sit on it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Booker. Um, I've got a few things to say. Um, I actually agree with Councillor Clark and Councillor Ashton, but um, Councillor Ashton, I would much rather than at research too, but as Councillor Perkins has pointed out, research didn't fit the criteria. Um, from a governance point of view, I, this really, really worries me much as I'd love to go out to consultation. I'm more concerned about our reputational damage in terms of getting grants from wherever and, and giving back, potentially having to give back money to the state government. I can't see them being, oh, we'll give Nilabit a grant. Oh, no, maybe not because they tend to give them back if they don't like it. I'm also worried about the cost in terms of damages and penalties cost and, our again, our reputational damage in terms of... Um, suppliers and, and going out to tenders and people wanting to take work here if all of a sudden we're going to pull the rug out from under them. Um, I know my decision's not going to be happy with Councillor Clark and Councillor Ashton, but um, that's where I, as the chair and the mayor, I, I think our, our reputational risk on council is more important. And I also feel for all of the people that have rung me and contacted me, I probably had a different view yesterday, but after hearing some of the um, discussion today and talking to the CEO and Yelma, that's where I stand at the moment. So um, I'll be voting against the motion. Did you want to write a reply, Councillor Clark? Yes, I do, Mayor. Just before I do, could, could uh, Yelma please outline to me what he would see as the consultation we've currently undertaken on this site? And, and I guess the second part of that is, have we had any conversations with the football club or the cricket club, or have we had any other sort of public meetings, general conversation with the community? Yeah, so through the chair, post um, uh, public notification of council's resolution in September 2019, uh, there've been discussions predominantly with the tennis club. I would need to take the question of the football and cricket club on question on notice. Uh, there were core flutes, as I understand, on the site from about July onwards, explaining the proposed layout um, of the site. Uh, so effectively public notice since around about that period um, and, and conversations with um, club and key users. And I'll have to uh, take the one on football club on notice. But nothing going out to, say, the residents around the park? So, social media and, and typical media channels, as I understand. No, no letters. Okay. Any other questions? No, Mayor. Um, so, look, just in, in reply, um, you know, it is somewhat ironic at the 11th hour when I've indicated uh, that I've got other residents now wanting me to move to their ward to represent them. Um, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I won't be continuing on the council. And I've got others who are wanting me to move to Alice Ward to represent them because there's dramatic change needed there. But again... Oh, I've got plenty there. Um, look, the, the short story is, and seriously, um, there has not been sufficient community consultation on this. Councillor Brooke is trying to guess the outcome of what the community consultation would have. 
Well, if we'd had the community consultation, we wouldn't be guessing. We would know what that, that had been. This has been a project which we've discussed with the tennis club, essentially. Um, and I've got no problem with that. Clearly, you know, that, that no one's arguing that they shouldn't have the tennis courts. The question is, have we got the best possible layout going? And indeed, the reason for me talking about the uh, three by three courts and, and the other sort of peripheral issues is, is simply that I want to make sure that if we end up with a master plan that we're all agreed on, that we've got all of those things sorted out. Because if you move the course, you could have an impact on the other funding regime that we've, we've put in. We don't know that we're going to get the 1.3. We're hopeful. Uh, some may not be so hopeful if they want more open space in this and less structured uh, type space in this area. I can't for the life of me see in the current circumstances, and I would certainly encourage officers to go and get DHS approval to start pushing bulldozers around in that location in COVID-19. I mean, I, I, my, my total activity is to be able to go out for an hour or two in a day and go and buy a cup of coffee and I'm lucky to get the Safeway. Yet for some reason, uniquely, we can't stop a project which in bleed, you know, the local members should be saying, don't start yet. This is COVID-19. I've shut down every business in Sundry. Yeah, we want to push a bulldozer around the park. We can't wait four days where we can have a chat to some residents and get a better outcome. Hopefully we can get a better outcome. So I would encourage the, the council to take the time, do the consultation. That, time. Is, that has been the motto of Council of Jumeric right throughout this process. Yet at the 11th hour, he walks away from public participation. Thank you, I've done my best for your residents. If your local councillors won't support you, I can do no more. Stand Go to yourself. Stand Go yourself. away. Put Go your away. away. Put your hand up and have a go because it looks like you're getting no Go support. away. Looks like we have to vote on the your urgent item of urgent. Yeah, I can understand why they're employing me to move to that ward, but anyway. All those in favour of Councillor Clark's um, item of urgent business. All those against? And that is not carried. Could I now, we actually now move on to the division. division? Yes, certainly. Yeah, we want to All make those, sure that everybody knows the failure of participation. All those in favour? Councillor Clark, Councillor Ashton. All those against? Councillor Egan, Councillor Brooker, Councillor Alice, Councillor Demery. Do our best. And Councillor Egan. I said that. Oh, good. Sorry. Mayor Egan. Something oh, Mayor and, and the... And the Can casting vote as well. Me. I didn't need to use it. Thank you. Uh, we now move on to confidential reports. Our first item is 18220, the hardship request. Can I have a mover for the oh. motion, please? So the motion is to move into confidential on all three items. Yes, and the motions are there. Do I need to read them out? Someone will need to move the motion that's on the table. Councillor Happy to move the motion. Councillor Perkins, can I have a second, please? I move the motion as for the papers. All those in favour? Yeah, I wish to sorry. to the resolution. Sorry, I'm getting all confused now. Yes, Councillor Clark, you're the seconder. So what I wanted, I, I, I'm happy to second it, but I just wanted to be able to make the point that we have not discussed earlier in the public forum the submission to DWELP on the Green Wedge Provisions Review Consultation Paper. Of the tender. Um, that matter will be dealt with in confidential. It is disappointing that that is the case. Um, we are aware of uh, some breaches of confidentiality with respect to that particular paper. Um, but indeed, the government has requested that we deal with these matters totally in confidential. Um, and uh, they have ex extended that period, indeed, until November 19, due to COVID. So it seems like we can't debate agricultural land in the Green Wedge, but we can build tennis courts. They're fine, no problem with that. Just can't talk about the matters that matter. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Councillor Brooker. Just through um, maybe... Rosa, about the submission. On the paper we've got in pink on page 40, it says submissions close on the 22nd of December. So I'm just wanting some 
clarification clarity on what what the the end date is I guess that's a question for Rosa if she's I mean correct Councillor Booker actually I know that's that's correct okay yeah. so so this this submission we we have got until the close of business on Tuesday the 22nd of sub, of December to submit to dwell if we so wish correct yes <laughs> yes we, yeah, we can do it earlier, but we've got until the 22nd of December. Rosa, I think she's clarified that. Yes, yeah, so th through the chair, um, we're still waiting on confirmation from Delp um, as to the exact um, dates, but they're dates that have been floated. Okay, thank you. Right, any other councillors wish to speak? No, Councillor Brooker. I don't think. I've. Sorry, I just asked a question. I haven't. If we put the resolution that they go to confidential, are we in the middle of that? Aren't we? That's what I was just asking. Did, so you want to speak now? I've put it. Councillor Clark seconded it. Are we voting on it. All those in favour? And that is carried. Thank you, everybody, to the <laughs> gallery. And good evening and good night from all of us here for the very last time, except for next week. Uh, there's 10 left. They're welcome souls. I know who they are. It's all right. <laughs>